Hallo. Hallo. Etter at jeg har ønsket velkommen, sier jeg ordet til Anne. Uh, og så kommer... That is correct. So I think we're starting. My name is uh, Lars Egeland, and I'm director of the of the Oslo Metropolitan University uh, Library. And I would like to wish you welcome to Oslo and to Oslo Metropolitan University. Something about Oslo, I guess you know, it's the capital of Norway, the largest city with uh, uh, around 600 and 50,000 inhabitants, and you might have seen already it's a compact city surrounded by the Oslo Fjord on its south side and forest and mountains north and west. So it's a city where you can go skiing in the winter and you can swim in the summer. And we like to think that Norway is an egalitarian and transparent society and that that means that we are easy uh, to connect with. Oslo have great ambitions as a green city, and it was also uh, last year uh, uh, a green capital for in Europe. 
uh, as you see, the city center is easily covered by on foot. Uh, it's a great connectivity to nature, which, which we tend to think is a central Norwegian value. And Oslo's aspiration is to be a green capital and be the first uh, fossil-free city in the world by 2030. You will see that there is a lot of electric cars in the streets, and uh, uh, in some few years, the whole uh, city center will be uh, car-free. It's a fast-growing and diverse region, one of Europe's fastest-growing cities, and also uh, the most with the most diverse population in Norway. And that's uh, have implications for the university. We have attractions like the Munch Museum, which is open, the ship, Viking Ship Museum, which is open, Holmenkollen Ski Jump, and uh, this weekend there will be a ski festival, uh, for, and I expect around 40,000 people to come. And uh, we have the opera, which you see here, and this is a new public library that will open later this month. Something about Oslo Net, delivering knowledge to solve societal challenges is the aim of the university and of course also the aim of the university library. We have 21,000 students, 2,500 employees, 63 bachelor programs, 42 master programs, 6 PhDs, divided into four faculties, 21 institutes, two research centers, and we are situated on two campuses. This is the main campus, and then we have one campus in the outskirt of Oslo. And something about the university library. We have four libraries, three here at the main campus, one at uh, the other campus, Kjeller. And we also have uh, uh, organized us with a department of collection and systems, which do all the internal work for the other libraries. And we have a unit for academic language and practice, which contains mostly of uh, academic staff that teach English for academic purposes, that teach uh, people that uh, are employed from abroad, uh, learn them Norwegian, uh, and also help immigration and people uh, with immigration background to, to cope with Norwegian. And we have a media department that produces films and, uh, and uh, digital uh, content. The staff is approximately 75. Something about the library and the publishing. We have, as many of you, institutional uh, uh, research and learning repositories. <coughs> we publish 15 research journals and a university publication series. We also run a small uh, uh, publishing house, ABM Media, on the field of archive, library, and museum. And uh, that is because we also have the library education, one of the two library educations uh, for Norway uh, here at Oslo Met. And we have a film archive. Filmet. We wanted to call it uh, Netflix. <laughs> we weren't allowed to do that. And we have, and that will be presented later, the bookshelf uh, digital uh, courses. Some screenshots from that. And some numbers uh, about the library. We have approximately 3,300 daily visits approximately 100,000 loans a year, and 1.3 million digital loans. So we are mainly digital. In addition, 260 downloads of films a year, um, and 500,000 downloads from repositories and journals. We also work with exhibitions and events, approximately 40 uh, a year. And, of course, lectures for students and staff. Lectures to approximately 12,000 students a year, a little more than half the number of students. 
and 3,000 appointments for counseling. And tomorrow we'll have a event because uh, 8 of March, but then we are not on, on the campus, but 8 of March is the Women's Liberation Day, so we celebrate that uh, on, uh, tomorrow, and this is from the celebration last year. I have to say something about the coronavirus. You might uh, be worried. I made this yesterday, and then the status for coronavirus in Norway was uh, three, uh, 33 people infected. Now it's 57. Uh, none of them are seriously ill or have been admitted to hospital. They are, and they are linked out to outbreaks in Italy, uh, one from Iran and uh, a couple from China. And the infected people are isolated at home and are being followed up by local health care service. And the recommendation is that healthy people who have stayed in areas with an ongoing transmis transmission of uh, the virus, and that is mainland China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Iran, South Korea, and some regions in uh, Italy. If people have stayed there during the 14 last days, and develop symptoms of respiratory disease, they should seek medical attention at once, and we can help you with that. And healthy people who have been in close contact with confirmed case, some person diag diagnosed with the uh, virus during the 14 last days, should also seek medical advice. And that means, uh, in reality, that they will have to stay home. So the recommendation for this conference is that persons with symptoms of the disease, fever, cough, respiratory symptoms, shall not participate at the conference. And beside that, cough etiquette and good hand uh, hygiene. Cough eti uh, etiquette is either in a paper towel or in your arm if you need to cough. And wash your hands very often, that will reduce the risk of respiratory uh, infections. Then, I think that was uh, uh, information that was important to give. Then I will give the floor to Anne Okerson, co-convener of the special interest group uh, on library publishing. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I get to welcome you even though I'm not from Oslo, but this has been splendid. I have been planning for a couple of months watching the weather saying I had better bring boots with traction in case it's slippery and icy and lots of warm clothes and prepare to stay in my hotel room because it will be too cold to go out. But none of those things has been true the last couple of days. It's been absolutely fantastic. And so, Lars, we thank you and your crew for this wonderful uh, setting and this wonderful invitation. You'll get to hear more about the IFLA Library Publishing Special Interest Group, SIG, tomorrow when we have a short business session. But in brief, we really organized ourselves at the IFLA World Library Congress in 2018 in Kuala Lumpur. Lars was there and some other colleagues. And uh, it was clearly a group with passion. Immediately on the spot, uh, or almost on the spot, uh, two people who are in the audience today who am I, whom I will introduce in a minute, um, offered the first midterm for the SIG, and they organized it with the help of a planning committee in absolutely short order. So we met in Dublin, Ireland, for the first time uh, a year ago, pretty much exactly, Lars was there, and so on. We had a wonderful conference around this size, uh, this type of agenda, and um, we're going to do the same here, if, if, if not better, of course. Um, so the, um, 
Something I wanted to ask, who here is from Norway? A lot of people from Norway. Who is here from outside the European community? It's quite... <laughs> okay, well... Um, so that's more than I expected. Now I'm trying to figure out who's here from farthest away. So it's probably, it's going to be someone outside the European Union. Um, you people who raised your hands, tell, tell us where you're from. Start in the back here. Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan. Washington State. Who is that? That's a ways away. You, you may get that prize. Uh, yeah? Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, well, it may be a draw between the two of you. U.S., Arizona. Arizona, not quite as far as Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, no, not as far. And I'm from Connecticut, so that's not as far either. But anyway, welcome, and especially for those of you who've made such an effort to get here, but really to everyone. I just want to uh, name a few names, and then I will sit down. Uh, but first of all, I do want to acknowledge uh, Jane Buggle and Marie O'Neill. They're sitting right there. Uh, put your hands up higher. These are the two uh, ladies from Ireland who uh, led the organization of the uh, midterm meeting last year. And they're here this year because they couldn't stay away. <laughs> right, so, so we thank them for uh, their presence and leadership and providing a kind of continuity, which we will continue with, with Lars. Um, there are a number of, well, the SIG operates with a kind of a small informal steering group and um, Marie and Jane and Lars and I are on that group, but there are people who could not attend and I just want to name them because they really wanted to be here. Uh, the convener of the group with me is Reggie Raju from South Africa, little far to come. Uh, Ekaterina Shibayeva from Russia, also could not attend. Grace Liu from Canada, Windsor, uh, Fiona Bradley, and uh, Heather Todd from Australia. So these folks could not be here, but I understand we are or we will be streaming live so that at least they can catch some of the proceedings. So on behalf of IFLA and the SIG and everybody, thank you for coming. We really look forward to this. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Yeah, we are streaming the whole conference. That means that we are streaming the presentations, but uh, and we are not uh, filming the audience, but if you raise up and walk out during the presentation, you might be on the film. So if that's a problem, you will have to, to tell us. And after the streaming, it will be available in our film archive, and I guess also from the, from the IFLA uh, SIG group. Yeah. Some other practical uh, uh, information from Guri. Yes, I'm just going to give you some practical information for the day and for tomorrow. So first, if the fire alarm should go off, uh, so please leave the building <laughs> through the exits. Um, the nearest restroom is just outside uh, the exit. Coffee and lunch will be served uh, outside where the registration was uh, for both days. Um, and if you had a special diet request, it will be put separately. So you look for it. Uh, if anyone would like to join us for dinner tonight, um, it's paid individually. It's not in the conference uh, fee. So um, it's a restaurant just across the campus here. Um, so please rise, raise your hand now if you know, or you can just come and give me notice before lunch today. So um, I can make a reservation, okay? Okay, yeah. 
Thank you. And we have one more uh, thing, the breakout sessions. You will find some more information in the handouts. Um, we have a whiteboard uh, outside. So during the breaks, if you could sign up sometime during the day today, so we know how many people uh, for tomorrow. And uh, we start tomorrow by, with uh, the breakout sessions. But you can all meet up here outside this room and then we will uh, take you to the different uh, rooms you are going to. Okay? And if you have any questions, please ask. Okay? Given the time that we have to go through the presentations and the sessions and all the things that we have to do afterwards, I'm very conscious that as we go through, you have to make sure you're familiar with the content of the presentation so that you can allow that information to be synthesized and made into a presentation. So, without further ado, let me introduce the Alex. Perfect. All right. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully. If not, hopefully that will work. Um, good morning. My name is Allie Laird. Um, I am one of the people that came from across the sea to get here, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm the Open Publishing Program Specialist from Penn State University in Pennsylvania, United States. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be chatting with you today on using Drupal as an open publishing platform in the libraries. So a few clarifications to start. I am not a Drupal programmer or expert by any means. Uh, so just when questions come up, just to clarify that, I will do my best to answer within the capacity that we use Drupal. Uh, but I'm very lucky to have some folks in the libraries that are Drupal experts that assist our publishing program. And also, we don't use Drupal for the submission or peer review process. And I'll get into that as we go through later. Um, but yeah, so we use it mostly to host the publications that we have that are ready. So we use Drupal as a publishing platform for primarily our bibliographies. That is the, the platform that we use for these types of publications the most. Uh, we have a handful of monographs that we've started publishing in the past two years um, that we also use Drupal to publish with. And then a handful of uh, publications that we call topical web portals. Um, they are basically digital humanities type publications, so those that don't fall within the traditional you know, monograph, journal, bibliography type publications. Um, and why we use Drupal is because we already have a handful of technical support and development um, staff members in the libraries that are already using Drupal for a variety of different purposes. Um, so it was very convenient to be able to tap into that knowledge and support um, and use this platform, this um, uh, thing for publishing. So what is Drupal for those that are unfamiliar? Um, Drupal is a free open source web content management framework that's written in PHP and it's distributed under the GNU General Public License. Um, so the GNU General Public License is basically the software equivalent of like a Creative Commons license. So it's freely available for anyone to download, to modify, to use, which makes it also extremely beneficial and helpful um, in our publishing program because we do host it locally at our university, uh, and thus we are able to um, 
Thus, we were able to kind of modify it for whatever purposes we need for our publications. So Drupal is being used in the Penn State libraries for quite a while, as I said. Um, many of those ways were our general library publishing website. So this is, or library website, excuse me. So this is just a screenshot of when you go to libraries.psu.edu, a bit of what the website looks like. We also use um, Drupal for our staff web pages, our staff blog posts, those types of things. Um, we also use it for our center and institutes websites and also for our library collection pages and what we call mic excuse me, microsites. So this is kind of a collaboration of the two. Um, at Penn State, we have different centers. One of them is the Civil War Era Center, and this is a collaboration project between the university libraries and that center. Um, so in many ways, this would be called technically a microsite within the libraries because it hosts some different digital collections, some digitized materials um, that are hosted in collaboration with the libraries and this center on campus. Um, and then also our libraries open publishing publications. And this is just a snapshot of what you'll see when you go to openpublishing.psu.edu. Um, so a quick overview of how we use Drupal for publishing the content. Um, when content comes to us, uh, we review it and it's approved by a library publishing advisory board that we have that's currently made up of four members and then myself as the ex officio non-voting member um, as the uh, uh, coordinator of the publishing program in the libraries. And then once that content is finalized, um, you know, uh, with either the editor or the author, depending on if it's a bibliography, topical web portal, that kind of thing, and it's prepared for publishing, that's when the, we then move it into Drupal for hosting and publication. So those steps are initiated by meeting with our development team, um, our library strategic technologies team, uh, to establish what the requirements for the publication are and then what the timeline is going to look like. Um, that development team then will create the skeleton of the Drupal site, depending on you know, what type of publication we're doing. And then it's up to the library's open publishing department to then migrate all of that content into Drupal and prepare it. Um, You'll see, we'll talk, talk a little bit later about some minor text editing that we do in code cleanup whenever it goes, especially if you're migrating content from Word, because as we know, Word can sometimes have some very tricky um, coding in there that we don't necessarily want to keep. And then we go through and make sure there's that style uniformity, and then also web accessibility, especially when it comes to colors, how things are displayed on the screen, that kind of thing. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the theming that we do. And we'll work with the publication editors or authors um, to figure out what type of theme they want, depending on their publication, any images or branding they might have, that kind of thing. Um, so for bibliographies, this is the home page of what our largest and kind of most famous bibliography um, looks like when you go to it. Um, this is actually the premier utopian bibliography uh, in literature. Uh, we just celebrated, we just had a celebration earlier this month because the editor has exceeded 10,000 entries in his bibliography, so it's quite expansive. Um, so we use a module called Biblio in Drupal to host these and publish these. We have an active developer in the library who actually contributes and monitors the different developments and code commits in GitHub uh, that others around the world are doing to Biblio. Um, and we're actually one of probably not a huge handful of people that are taking advantage of this Biblio uh, module to publish bibliography. So we're very lucky that he's very involved in that. Um, this is what it looks like whenever you search the bibliography. It allows for uh, organization of individual entries, including some customizable fields, which is why it's so helpful for publishing a bibliography. You can also export the um, information, the citations in a variety of different formats. So it helps for using kind of the content as data and being able to not only cite more easily the bibliography content, but also to compare, use it in whatever type of research, um, you know, capacity people are using it for. And you can also um, refine your search and then also export just that specific search if that's something that is important to you. Um, they also allow for static information pages, such as this one. He has a very long um, introduction article on why his bibliography is important, kind of the history going into it. Um, and so in order to kind of give an overview of how we set that up, the request comes to us, which then gets, you know, approved um, through, our, um, through our advisory board. We then get the site from our library strategic tech, Oy. and then we customize Oy. it. So to kind of go back and give you an idea of customizing, again, that top banner, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but that's yeah. something that, you know, we would do, making sure that, you, that. you know, back on this front home page, you know, his image is ah. in there correctly, things are ah. you know, ah. set up in there the way that he wants it. <laughs> that building's staying alive. I'm just going to slip over to all of them. 
Um, then we will take the editor's content and we prepare it for upload into Drupal. So that's kind of the bulk of the work whenever it comes to um, preparing the content to be published. We work in collaboration with the editor, make sure all of their content, all of their information is correct. There are no typos, you know, all of those types of things. Um, and I also have if there is any in there, because some bibliographies are just starting up fresh, we'll set up the site. If they have a small amount of entries, they can add them that add those entries themselves later, and I'll, you know, share about that in a second. Um, but if there is content, of which most of the time there is, we verify that content usually in Excel before we then convert it to an XML file for upload into Drupal, where it will then organize the content. You can go in and add additional changes and edits once it's already up into Drupal. And then after that, if it's an ongoing bibliography where additional entries are going to be added, we create an account for the editor, and then they can log in and continuously add content going forward. So here is an overview of what that screen looks like when they log in. It's uh, under the tab Create Biblio, and then you give your, you know, the publication a title, and then you go through all of these different tabs on the sidebar and add, you know, if you have the abstract, if you have you know, any identifiers, those types of things. And our uh, bibliography editors definitely take full advantage of all of those areas to add as much thorough information as they can. Um, for monographs, these are a little bit more straightforward. As I said, we don't use uh, Drupal for authoring or for um, peer review processes. So it's really taking that finalized content and migrating it into Drupal to be displayed and published. This is a screenshot of what the kind of title page looks like for one of our monograph publications. Um, it's on immigration and from the Center of Immigration, um, the C Penn State Law's Center for Immigration Rights Clinic. Um, so it had, you know, a, a collection of chapters or articles and then some really fantastic uh, photos that they had taken uh, that they were able to integrate into this to make the title page look very uh, interesting. So again, all of that theming and stuff were things that we worked on with the editor to prepare for publication. Um, so for the monograph setup, again, after it's accepted, we take the content, we prepare it for Drupal, and this is generally done in Word, you know, as we're making sure that there are no typos, that we kind of have all the heading information that we need, that we're putting in the author, you know, information at the top, the way we need it, uh, biographies, those kinds of things. And then we provide the basic theming in Drupal. We migrate the content into Drupal and do some basic code cleanup, again, to make sure nothing is displaying weirdly, which it will if you don't do that cleanup, and also to make sure that um, everything is uniform, again, throughout the publication. Uh, and we don't use, again, for authoring or review process. So this is a, an example of what it looks like on that title page if you were to click on one of the essays. So you can read through the essay, um, read through the chapter. It has the, um, the table of contents on the side. And additionally, once you get to the bottom of the page, you can just click the next button, and it will take you to the next chapter um, as you read through it. And then this is what it looks like on the back end whenever you're migrating the content into it. So again, adding the title, adding the text into that body. Um, under that text format button, or section, I guess I should say, at the bottom, a, you can look at it in full HTML or in plain text. And plain text is where we'll go through and make sure there's no weird coding or styling happening on the back in the background that we don't want. And then also image right there. That's where you can upload those images that will then be displayed on that title page because of the theme that we used. Um, and so we used those all of those fields to kind of prepare that publication that you saw. And this is the kind of the bottom of the page, you know, prefix image or suffix image. That's whether you want it to be before in that block before or after the article, those types of things. And again, um, down under book outline, the weight is then where we will select kind of where it falls within that, um, within that table of contents. So where that chapter shows up within the entire publication. And then for topical web portals, it's kind of a combination of both, which is why I have it here at the end. Um, kind of uh, our topical web portals, as I said, really fall under something that's not really a book, not really a bibliography, but most of the time they have elements of both. Many topical web portals will include a bibliography um, that kind of accompanies or supplements their larger you know, publication. Um, so again, many, most of the time we'll have both of those things. Um, we also really heavily utilize the static information pages, so just you know historical information or additional resources, those types of things. Many of them, um, or one in particular, has a blog that the um, editor author likes to you know continually update and add information about her current research. 
There could be articles, case studies, abstracts, etc. And one of them definitely has a tech uh, or an image collection, I should say, of different types of uh, materials that she includes within both her bibliography and in her research. Um, mapping elements, those types of things, all of that can be kind of included within a topical web portal. So this is that topical web portal that we have. Um, the Union Catalog for Early Movable Books is what she calls her bibliography portion of that. Learning is Play is the name of the entire uh, topical web portal collection. Some of her pages she's still migrating into Drupal because she had started this project in WordPress, um, which is why I'm not including all of the pages here, but hey. it really includes a bibliography, a map, Shh. image collection, and then static information. Oh, no. So just a few final takeaways, since I know I ran through all that really quickly. Um, Drupal works excellently for our bibliographies and topical web portals. We probably won't, so long as you know Biblio and everything like that continues, you know, working and being supported. We're probably not going to change how we're doing things because we really, really feel that. Uh, Drupal works perfectly for the bibliographies. Monograph publishing is one that we have this tool at our fingertips and we're very excited to be able to use it to be able to expand our portfolio to publishing monographs. Perhaps in the future, if we have you know additional funding or other opportunities to look into some of the very awesome uh, monograph publishing tools that are coming out, we may eventually you know migrate to one of those especially if it has other tools you know such as authoring or things um, that would be more beneficial to us I could see us moving to that um, but the biggest takeaway is that you really can and should leverage the resources that you're already using in the libraries and the expertise that other departments um, that you have at your fingertips um, because it can really help you to expand your publishing prog program and provide support sooner than perhaps waiting around to try and you know get justification for some other type of software for Know, monograph publishing as an example so thank you very much if you want to take a closer look at any of the publications that I mentioned as I said you can go to openpublishing.psu.edu and poke around um, otherwise I think questions are at the end of all the sessions thank you thank you very crisply done um, the second of our platform discussions will be by Cheryl Ball of Wayne State University Libraries in the United States. She will be speaking on Vega, starting a new OA academic publishing platform. Cheryl, welcome. <laughs> I thought I'd been paying attention. Or does it sit on my ear like that? <laughs> Super awkward. I love it. <laughs> okay, can everybody hear me okay? Is it is it on? It doesn't sound like it's on when you're up here, so it's... It's okay? Okay, all right, great. <gasps> Let's try this again. Okay, how's that? So-so? Better? Could be better? Okay, all right. Let's try this. Thank you. I am so excited to be back at Oslo Met. I was here last June for um, the, the INFIP conference, the Norwegian uh, Forum for English for Academic Purposes conference uh, with, uh, with uh, Christy and a bunch of folks who work in the academic writing program here. Um, that's my other, my other half of my life was as an, a faculty member who t taught academic literacies for 15 years. Um, but I migrated into publishing several years ago because of a journal that I edit named Kairos. And I'm not going to talk about Kairos today, um, but you should go look it up. It's spelled K-A-I-R-O-S. Um, and it's a multimedia, scholarly multimedia journal that's been publishing online in open access form since 1996. And we ran into the problem um, about 15 years ago that we realized we needed a content management system that could handle the capabilities of the kinds of texts that Kairos published, but there wasn't anything. And there still really isn't anything that can handle that specific kind of, of text. And if you're familiar with the kinds of um, the web projects that Ali was talking about or digital humanities, 
humanities types of projects or, or digital research based projects that use a lot of visualization or video or interactivity, that's what the kind of stuff is that Kairos and journals like it publish. So it's, we really couldn't use something like Drupal or open journal systems where you're embedding a little piece into something else. We needed a content management system that would allow what we call a web text instead of an article to, to use the full um, affordances of the internet and of the web in order to convey its design as well as its rhetorical argument. Uh, so finally, after quite some time, uh, we were able to raise some funds uh, and get a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to build Vega. Um, now, the Norwegians in the room might uh, know this, this, the title of this differently because this project actually started in Oslo when I was here five years ago for a Fulbright. Uh, I was a Fulbright scholar at um, AHO, uh, one of the other universities in town, uh, the architecture and design school across, across town, uh, where I was collaborating with my partner, Andrew Morrison over there, who's a design professor. And we hatched this idea with a local um, design studio. It was then named uh, Bengler, and they've rebranded re as Sanity. Um, so the, the local folks in the room might be familiar with the, the, some of the players in Oslo that we've been working with. But I'm really excited to sort of come full circle to talk to you about where Vega is five years on uh, and give you a status update um, back, back in Norway, which is great. Um, so we do have a website. Uh, we've been slow to publish things just because it's a very small team working on this, this publishing platform. And it's, we, rec we created uh, Vega from the ground up. It's a brand new system that doesn't build on any other systems, uh, which has its ups and downs, right? It's not like we're just adding features uh, to Drupal or plugins to OJS, open journal systems. Uh, we've, we've architected this to be for multimedia forward born digital publications from the outset. Um, and so we have uh, some updates that we've published, including some recent ones. We just hired a new web developer after um, about eight months of looking for some funding for that. We were able to get some internally. Um, so I encourage you to go to the website to, to check around a couple of things that we've got there. Uh, and there's, there's the URL also for our website. Um, and then Again, some of the partners that we've been able to work with on this project uh, throughout the last five years. And now we've, we've, the grant started when I was at West Virginia University, but now I've gone to Wayne State, where there's a m much larger, robust library publishing program. Uh, so we've teamed with about eight librarians and library staff members at Wayne State, which is in the heart of Detroit, Michigan, in the US, um, to continue uh, developing this project. So. Oh, I was afraid that would happen. Well, it's a little postmodern, just like Vega. Uh, <laughs> we like to do interactive experimental work here with Vega. Uh, so one of the, some of the features that I wanted to briefly talk with you about today um, is that Vega is a, a, a soup to nuts program, as they might say. In other words, it has an authoring platform. We don't yet have a submission management system, but that's part of what we're going to be building with phase two, so that authors can upload their work, they can author the work also in the system if they want, or they can copy and paste it from other systems, and the, and the system will scrape all of any garbage that happens with HTML or Word or Google Drive um, authoring to clean it up to create structured text out of it. That authoring platform also doubles as the editing platform. So cop peer review and copy editing happen, can happen within the system. And it is built currently so that you can have um, both um, um, double anonymous peer review, sort of traditional blind peer review, if we will. I don't call it blind review because I find that's too ableist. So I like to call it anonymous peer review. Um, the Vega supports that kind of system as well as an open or crowdsourced peer review option, if you would like. Um, so it, it, it's really pushing on that idea of openness as much as possible uh, in the way that work gets accomplished in scholarly communications. Um, in that way, authors and editors can come together in the publishing platform collaboratively, simultaneously, just like they might in Google Drive, as, an, as another example. Um, so that can happen. Um, and then the system tracks how work moves through. Um, moves through. This is an example of the, the um, 
the authoring platform. Everything's done sort of in chunks. The way that WordPress has more recently been sort of revised, if you're familiar with that system, so you have text blocks uh, that happen in a much more structured way. Um, this is a, a screenshot of our workflows, uh, our, our workflow tab. Uh, actually, <laughs> one of our very, very earliest partners, not partners, but like collaborators on this project was um, a journal called Form Akademisk, which is published out of Oslo Met. So we've got that listed as the example in the upper left-hand corner. It's a, it's a design pedagogy journal um, that's published in open journal systems here. Uh, so uh, here's an example of what the interface would look like if you are a journal editor and going in and you want to track where your submissions are, where the articles, or uh, this also works for monographs or any other kind of data that you might want to put into the system. Um, so you can name uh, things in the different sections. Here we've got book reviews, case studies, letters, original articles, but those can be changed super easily within the system, within this interface, so you can go in and say, okay, I'm working on an edited book instead of a journal, uh, a journal venue. So your book might have different sections like front matter, back matter, um, case studies, etc. Uh, each of those tracks, as we like to call them in Vega, uh, assumes a particular kind of workflow, editorial workflow that might happen. And so what the system is trying to do is to teach library publishers some of the different ways of publishing different types of material. As, as we know, and I know if Liz, if the IFLA SIG has been talking about that, and the Library Publishing Coalition uh, out of North America has been working on the library publishing curriculum, which I'm the new editor-in-chief of, and I can talk about that later if y'all want, but we want to help teach people how publishing happens across all the different genres that we might be working in within a library. So Vega sort of accommodates that by saying, okay, if you have case studies, as one example that's listed here in the second row, you might, have, you might not have the first stage, right? That might not apply in that case. So it would be grayed out in the system uh, because you can set it and say, okay, I need case studies to go through um, a submission process, a peer review process, and the peer review process needs to be um, open, you know, publicly open or open within a confined set of users. It doesn't need to go through copy editing for whatever reason, so you skip that section. And it all happens within one screen. So unlike other programs where you might have to jump back and forth and sign in and sign out in order to get to the kinds of um, uh, workflows that you might need to create, you can do that all within one screen in Vega. And then it will automatically skip that one for that particular kind of text, the case study. Whereas articles, you might want it to go through everything, and you can just leave that workflow. And if you need to skip or push anything as an editor or a publisher beyond a certain stage, you can do that really easily within just by looking at the article itself. Okay. The other thing that this screen shows you is how many pieces are in each stage in each category at any given time. Right. So, for instance, we've got um, three articles in the completed case studies group and two articles in the completed letters group, et cetera. Um, and you can click on any of those to get into the articles themselves. All right. Uh, whoops, wrong computer. <laughs> um, it will show you what issues are in development all at a glance. So this might look like your table of contents that you can click on, and it expands and drops down and shows you how many articles or how many uh, chapters are in a book, um, as well as uh, the developmental tab color coding that we saw on the other screen, which is also changeable. Uh, so at a glance, you can s look at all these dots on the right-hand corner and say, oh, OK, this is how many I still need to work on that are in peer review, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of uh, ways of manipulating the metadata in Vega so that you can sort of change them in this really nice GUI interface uh, within the system. Um, and add users and remove users and do it in bulk ways and uh, add um, this is an open source platform, so it's infinitely changeable. And we hope other people might participate in the development. Um, 
Also caveat, I'm not a developer. <laughs> I'm the project director. So one, one of our developers created this slide to sort of show how Vega is working technically. And I'd be happy to return to this um, and maybe parse my way through it. Um, but it's essentially got three different parts that build on Node and a Mongo database. And they sort of all work together to create the graphic studio of Vega. There's a lot of JSON involved. Um, OK, so uh, just summing up. One of the, some of the key points about Vega that I want you to be able to take away is um, this is a free software that is available on GitHub. Anybody can download and use it. It's not very easy to download and use it right now because a million dollars only goes so far in development. We've got a couple of little things that we still need to fix, which is why we just hired a web developer to help us tweak those final little things. Um, so, because the period of the grant has ended, right? So we are we're working to to uh, um, add some more authentication mechanisms because uh, it was built to authenticate with with Google, but sometimes we need something that's not Google, right? Uh, <laughs> so this is the this is the problem with free is then we have to go find money, which we're in the process of doing again for the second round of funding. Um, but it is free. It is open source. Anybody can download it and contribute to the code and get it using at their home institution. Our own plans at Wayne State are to bring this up as a hosted platform, uh, which you've seen some of the other uh, development platforms doing lately, so that we can offer hosting services to anyone in the world who wants to start journals and books and other kinds of publications. Um, it is meant to be rich media forward, right? So we want to be able to have authors publish research in the mediums that they need in order to convey their research, uh, whether that's linear text or whether that is audio, video, interactivity, et cetera. The workflows are all flexible and really, really easy to use. And I don't say that lightly, because <laughs> I know the word easy can be a trap. Um, but it's surprising to me every time we've done user testing on this or introduced the systems to someone new, uh, they're like, oh, you know, it, it takes them a second to sort of wrap their head around the fact that this platform intends publishing to be bo truly born digital, digital from the moment of conception to the moment of preservation. Uh, there's, we get asked a lot, like, where's the track changes feature in this? And I'm like, that's a print-based mechanism for publishing that we don't need in the same ways if we're truly going to be publishing open access work in a digital environment. That's what version control is for, right? Uh, so there's some ways to sort of think differently about publishing that I think this platform is going to help us do over the next 10 or 15 years. And then one of the key points that, uh, that a lot of people do like about Vega is you're not tied to a particular template or structure. This outputs as uh, it, it's, um, oh, what's the word, unopinionated in how you put the output uh, to, to readers. Uh, so while it ships with a particular kind of template, you can output it with a Python front end, with um, HTML. You can style your CSS in any way you want so that your venue looks however you want it to look. And it doesn't have any structure, right? Going back to my first example about Kairos, how we didn't want anything interfering with the web texts, Vega doesn't interfere with how the content of the, of the venue, the scholarly venue, is delivered. OK, I better wrap up, I suppose. Um, oh, one last word, again, returning to the Norwegian roots of this program. Um, maybe none of you in the room will recognize this picture, but I love showing this picture. Uh, I often get asked where the name Vega came from. And it's actually the third iteration of, of the naming because of, uh, well, the first one ended up being trademarked uh, by someone else. Uh, the second one, um, the Norwegian developers couldn't pronounce. <laughs> uh, they were like, Cheryl, it's really hard to say Cairn. And they kept saying it like pirates. And so <laughs> I was like, OK, that's not going to work. They're like, can we change it? And so the, the uh, folks in Oslo actually suggested that we call the system Vega. And I had a lot of concerns about that, uh, given my American context, because there's all sorts of, like, Chevy Vega was a terrible car that no one should own. Um, Suzanne Vega has a great song called Tom's Diner that will get stuck in your head on an endless loop. Uh, so I had concerns. And they said, no, 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 wait. And then they pulled up this picture of Google Earth of the Vega archipelago. 
which is off the western coast of Norway. And they showed this to me, and I said, oh, my gosh, this is beautiful. Where is it? And they told me about it. And they said there's, there's what, hundreds of islands in this archipelago and, like, 200 eider duck, right? And very few people live there. It's very small fishing villages if you haven't been there. Um, but I love this photo because it reminded me of a network map. And what I hope with Vega, as with the archipelago, that when the tide comes up, journals and publications, digital publishing, might become subsumed by the water, right? By the layers of things that pile over it on the internet. And we lose digital venues all the time because of that, tide, that rising tide. But what Vega, we hope, will help us accomplish is that when the tide goes out and more venues rise up to the surface, they're still going to be there, even when the tide comes back in and gets covered over. So we're thinking about Vega as an experimental, but also multimedia forward long-term preservation platform for scholarly communication that will always be there, hopefully, as the Vega Archipelago will be. So thank you. Carol, thank you. So our third speaker this morning will be Marissa McDonald from the Public Knowledge Project in Canada. Uh, she will be speaking, Shaping the Future of Scholarly Publishing, Library Participation in Enhancing Open Infrastructure. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me OK? I cannot hear myself, so. Um, thank you. I'm going to start off with just a brief introduction just to set the context of who I am and where I'm coming from and why I'm, I'm here today. Um, I am the communications coordinator for the Public Knowledge Project. And, oh, and uh, what that means is essentially the work I do is really around um, engaging with our communities, sharing stories, um, building relationships, and connecting with community. And I joined PKP in January 2019, so I'm still relatively new to all of this and to meeting everyone who's involved in this community. And uh, communications, uh, really, this is a new role for PKP as well, too. So uh, the other, as everyone else has said so far, I am not a software developer. Uh, I am probably the least technical member of the PKP team. So. Apologies, I can't answer some of the, the more technical questions today, but I am an advocate for PKP. I'm also here as a librarian, and that's important for me because this isn't just a presentation. I will use examples from my organization, but by no means am I um, here just to talk about PKP. And I want to encourage, no matter what infrastructure you're using, um, if you're using open source for library publishing, to encourage you to get involved. So that's my background. I will say, Public Knowledge Project, for people who may or may not be aware, you've probably heard, all heard of open journal systems. So we created and maintain open journal systems. Um, but you, you might not be aware of as our history. Um, PKP began more than 20 years ago, 1998, when our founder and director, John Walensky, uh, was really looking at the issue of how to reduce cost as a barrier to creating and consuming scholarship. He was an education professor. He wanted the students, after they left academia, to still have access to research, for the community to have access to research output. He saw that the cost was a barrier with online information, and we never set out to develop software per se, but that's what happened. So Open Journal Systems was born in 2001, almost 20 years ago, and um, since then we now have a, a kind of a uh, a suite of, of software, including OJS, Open Monograph Press, and newly uh, launched last week, Open Preprint sy excuse me, Systems in Beta. Um, we do more than just software, though. We still do, as we began as an academic project, we still do um, research education and advocacy around open access. And we also have a publishing services division as part of our organization. This is where some of the revenue that we get from hosting, um, from doing consultation, and um, from doing custom development, that revenue comes back into our organization and helps us fund the software. And we do this with two academic homes. We are um, administration home at uh, Simon Fraser University Library in Canada. And as well, John Malinsky is based out of Stanford University, and that's our research home. 
So why am I here today? Um, I was inspired by the, the theme of the conference, which was connecting and empowering library publishers. And the word empowerment really struck with me about, um, Wikipedia has a quote here, um, for what it's worth, I, I liked it. It says, to do work with power. And I really liked that about what libraries were doing and contributing to um, open infrastructure. And so in my first year with PKP, what I started to notice and, and, and identify was some of the really amazing work that library publishing was doing to contribute back to our project. And so I thought I wanted to come here today, share some examples of how you can contribute to open infrastructure using my organization, but also inspiring you no matter what software platform you're using, why it's important for you to contribute back to open and how you can do that. Really briefly, I'm not going to get into open infrastructure, but I think we um, are all familiar with this idea of free and open source software. Um, that's what I'm referring to today. Um, platforms you've already heard of two so far today with Drupal and Vega. So this is what I'm talking about, these infrastructures. And what's really, really great with library publishing today is that libraries have choice of what to use. And I think this is very empowering. Uh, there was a report uh, last year put out by MIT Press called Mind the Gap, and they cataloged 52 open platforms um, for scholarly publishing. And I think they started with, I think they had upwards of 80 when they started looking at them. So there's a lot of choice out there for you to use. And they described them as durable alternatives. Um, I think it's important to look at ourselves um, in relation to uh, commercial products as well. And it's really not just about being durable, but how can we be competitive in this market as well, in this area, so that people choose open over some of these solutions. So why would you choose open? Um, we know there's choice. We know you have an option of what to use. And I think there is the option that it is free. Uh, that cost definitely does play a factor into why institutions are choosing open. It's flexible, the ability to not lock your data in. Those are some of the values and things that are important. But really, I think it's important. A lot of us here today are choosing open because it meets the values of the institution, the open knowledge. Um, that is why you're supporting open. So it's important to remember that. And if you support open and you support open and you're choosing open because of those values of open knowledge, open access, um, open source, we have to work together to make it better. There is contributions to make it better. Um, Invest in Open talks about the need for a more integrated, collaborative, and strategic way of working together. And the thing is, we know that community is an important part of open source software, but we have to think about what, what does that mean. It's not enough that we just use open source software, but it's, it's becoming active and contributing members to these communities. Um, I think there's responsibilities on each side, the users and the service providers, to contribute back to these projects. Um, and I say to rise above corporate publishers, but more so to be competitive with corporate um, is really what it's about, so that we're choosing open because it is the best option out there and making them the best that they can be. So again, what I mentioned, I, my last year with PKP, my first year, sorry, not last year, hopefully. <laughs> Um, in my first year with BKP, uh, I started to notice some really valuable contributions that libraries are making. And so I'm going to talk about those different types of contributions to hopefully inspire and empower you to get more involved. And often with open source, we think of code. Developers, software developers contributing code. And there's much more that you can do than that. There's technical, non-technical, and financial. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about each of these contributions, use an example from my own organization to il illustrate, um, and then maybe prompt you to how you might want to get involved with whatever open infrastructure you might be working with. All right, so technical. Um, we heard a little bit earlier about what it means to be free and open source software, the ability to run, copy, distribute, study, change. And I think the most important thing is to improve the software. Um, if you're going to contribute technically, we need to be contributing to improve. And it doesn't have to just be code. And so my example here today is, um, as I mentioned, we do have a publishing services um, division to PKP. And so University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing Services uh, sponsored recently development to add article and editorial statistics to open journal systems. So they came to us, um, asked for this custom development feature to be added to the software, and they provided the funding to enable us to, to make this happen. Um, this feature now is released in OJS uh, 3.1.2, and as of last Friday, OJS 3.2. Um, 
the fact that they came to us with an idea, wanted to make the software better, was able to contribute financially towards it, um, this feature is now available to everyone who uses the software. And that's the beauty of this community, work together. Um, when you work towards improving the code and you contribute that code, or um, your service provider might contribute back that code, that benefits the entire community, and we all get a better um, product in the end. Another important one from PKP to note is that uh, financial and in-kind contributions come in a lot from um, our development partners as well. So we have three major ones here. I wanted to talk about Pittsburgh, British Columbia, and Alberta. All three of these institutions are supporting um, technical development within our uh, software with being part of technical governance, usability testing, preservation, um, their expertise, and it's really libraries driving that within um, our software. So it's important to note that technical contributions can be software developers writing code, but it can also be participating in other things and other ways that improve the software. So if you're using open infrastructure, ways to get involved, um, look to your service providers and are they do they value open practices as well? Are they sharing back code? Um, uh, how can you contribute code? Does the, uh, does the software allow you to contribute code back? And, and how open is open? I think that's an important consideration. Um, and also looking at whether the infrastructure prioritizes development based on community needs. These are all things you want to look for in your open infrastructure and encourage um, to get involved. The non-technical, and a lot of times we, people ask, how can I contribute? I'm not a software developer. Um, there's more to software than code and more to making it better. Documentation, user testing, accessibility, translation. These are all areas in which you're experts and experts um, and have ideas to contribute back. And the one I'm going to focus on for PKP is our documentation. Um, I, in Barcelona in November, we had a PKP sprint. Um, that's one of the ways that community comes together to work on the software. And we had a group of scholarly communications librarians came together, and in two days, they wrote this instructor guide for course journals for those using OJS. So in just two days, they sat down at a table, worked on this um, particular piece, and it's now available openly in our documentation hub. And so it's just one of those contributions that the libraries are taking their expertise, sitting down, and then giving back. Um, we do have a documentation interest group. Um, that also works, and it's predominantly led by libraries. So it's very, very interesting to see ways you can give back um, in documentation. Another one that happened at one of our development sprints um, is the um, is advocating for, for different changes in features and features and infrastructure. So we had a sprint part of the Library Publishing Forum, the Library Publishing Coalition, in Vancouver last year, and a group from Ontario came to us and said. We need OJS, we need the software to um, be more accessible. We need to meet legislation. And so the group sat down and they worked through what would this look like? What do we need to do? Um, and they completed two projects for us at that sprint and includes a roadmap for us to achieve um, the web accessibility guidelines required. Libraries were advocating for this to be in our software. They came to us, they came together. Um, just a really important way that you can contribute is through that advocacy. So look for activities, ways. Um, does the infrastructure have an event, a community forum, focus groups? What are the ways that you can contribute back to your infrastructure? Is your voice being heard? Can you participate in the governance of these, um, these products? Um, is there a user group that you can join or participate in that then can, can um, communicate back to the infrastructure? Really look to what you're using and how you can contribute that way. And the last one is the... Uh, not everyone has the means to do this, but financial, of course, is a very important part of contributing to open infrastructure. Um, free to use does not mean free to develop. And uh, the same, uh, in the same regards, it does, um, you yourselves are also putting in a lot of time and money into the software development within your own institutions, too. Um, there are some examples of, of libraries that can contribute back. And so 80% of our um, sustaining members are, are academic libraries, which I'm thrilled to know. Um, they're an important part of our advisory committee, our technical committee, so they have a voice and they're putting funds towards making it possible. Um, most recently, PKP was endorsed by SCOS, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, SCOS. Um, what's interesting about SCOS, and so we were one of three, so along with DOAB and OAPEN, Open Citations and PKP, 
SCOS has endorsed us and said um, that uh, we are part of the infrastructure in which to um, they're seeking funds to um, help ensure long-term sustainability of these different open infrastructures. So the first round, they were endorsing uh, DOAJ, Sherpa Romeo. The second funding cycle, we've been included. Um, why I bring this up is that libraries are leading the charge here. So the member organizations of SCOS are coming from libraries. And so they're really the ones that are coming out there and saying, please support these um, vital infrastructure. And so libraries do have a voice um, in developing the infrastructure. And so when it comes to financial, it's really looking at how and advocating within your own institution, if you're using open, are there ways to contribute back? Um, can you become a member of an organization? Can you make a donation? Does your organization able to support financially? Are you part of a consortium that contributes back to open infrastructure? So remember in the financial cost as well and that those contributions um, go a long way in making open infrastructure better um, for everyone. And really, um, I think we're all of different institutions, different shapes and sizes. Um, the ways that you can contribute doesn't have to just be development, um, doesn't have to be code, and doesn't have to be money. There's a lot of way that you're already investing your time into open infrastructure. The idea is to remember to not work in that vacuum, not to work in that silo, and to share and to talk and to um, work with us as a community, work with the infrastructure to um, kind of share some of the, the different ways that you're, you're making the software better. Uh, for us as PKP, our software is um, decentralized. We don't know a lot of the times what's happening around the world, what people are doing with our software. So it's important that we listen and learn from the community and that the community as well communicates back and says we've made these updates and changes and that we're responsive. Um, so no matter what infrastructure you're using, hopefully there's a way that you can make a contribution and um, to do more work with power is what I thought today. Um, we've just got some, if you'd like to talk to us more about this, we've got Twitter, Facebook, and a community forum. Um, thank you. Now I'm going to ask the same question, can you hear me? And I'm also going to say, I'm not the technical guy. <laughs> so now you're warned. Um, I'm going to present our platform, um, talk a bit about the results of what the work we've done, uh, talk about why you need to have a platform like our server, and then end up discussing why the libraries, because university, universities have so many other departments that could do the same work, or perhaps not. Well, let's start with tisco.dk, journal.dk. Um, we started in 2007. Um, we right now have 153 journals online in yearbooks. We had a, more than 4 million downloads uh, last year. Um, we're using open journal system. We started with that in 2007. Uh, so we're quite happy for the system software. Um, we see ourselves as a platform provider, not as a publisher, and there's a difference. We use a platform, and the journals have to take care of peer review and all that, uh, copy editing. Um, because we are rather cheap, uh, we are not a free server, but we are rather cheap. Um, and then the server has been used as inspiration for our platform for ebooks with 240 publications online using OMP. Um, it's so supposed to be open access platform, uh, 136 publications now with immediate open access. The rest have embargoes, mostly one year. We have a couple of journals with five years embargo. But we were experimenting in the beginning, so they're good old friends of the family, and we don't want to put any kind of pressure on them. So we accept that they have longer embargoes. But if you start today, you're only allowed to have one year embargo maximum. The results, well, <laughs> We have gained access to Danish research. Um, we made it possible for new journals to be born and constructed on the, on the platform. 
107 of the plat of the journals and yearbooks are active right now. Uh, I'm always taking that number up because when I left uh, to Oslo, a new journal came online. So um, six of the journals actually have moved. Some of them because we helped the University of Aalborg to create their open journal system server. And we said, well, you can start your uh, business in Aalborg, and then some of your journals can start on our server to have a platform. And then we said, when, when you're ready, you can just take the journals. Uh, but st some of the articles are still on our server. Uh, 34 uh, journals uh, published their first issue on the server, and we estimate that about 20 of them could not have been created if they would not have this kind of service for them. Uh, and well, then we have four which are ready to digitized. It's a long story, but the server in Copenhagen and the server in uh, Aarhus were, were merged together as the two national libraries merged into one. And the good people in Copenhagen, they did work a lot with the digitization of old journals. So a lot of them now are online at our server. And 11 of the journals are um, previous versions of active journals, because we realized that if you have a journal and you take the old version of the journal with an old title and put it into one instance, you can't pr produce any good metadata. So we have had to create 11 special journals for this. Um, yeah. Now, why should we offer a service like this? Well, <laughs> I'm a Dane. Only 5 million, perhaps 6 million people understand or talk Danish. And then the good people from Norway will understand some Danish, and the good people of Sweden will understand that. But that's about it. That's a problem if you want to operate a journal online, because we're not big enough to be interesting, economically viable, interesting for professional publishers. So some of the journals were having problems to get recognized and published. Um, we also had an idea that we want to help existing journals, Danish journals, to come, become digital at the beginning of this work and make sure they were open access and could be part of the open science uh, society. And of course, we wanted to help new journals to be born. Um, science is changing, new topics are coming up, and we need to ensure that Danish journals have a possibility to be published in Danish. Um, we also used the system especially to help the people in Aalborg to ensure that journals from a given university can be presented online um, as a collection. And then we realized, with all the work, that servers like this requires IT and knowledge about IT uh, that the editorial teams of the journals do not have themselves. Uh, if we, when we start to talk about all this coding, uh, it's all black for them. And if they had to operate a server like this, it would be very expensive for each journal to have one. So, so we, we decided to have the service. Um, and then there is a problem about open access. Well, a problem. They don't get any money from subscriptions anymore because material must be open access. So they don't get any funding. And we realized that APCs is not something that are used by Danish journals. They look at us very strange. Sometimes this, it seems like we say something naughty when we say, yeah, we can take in money. Uh, but the result is that they don't have any kind of income. And that makes it hard to publish and use technology. So, so uh, we need a system like this. And then we come to OJS, and I am a big fan. There might be other systems. I heard about them today. Um, but it covers the entire workflow for submission to publication in one go. That helps the editorial boards a lot. Um, then it distributes metadata on a professional level. We're sure that other systems can read what we're doing. That is a big help. Um, and we can integrate with DOI, DOAJ, and Orkin, and things like that in a professional manner. It sort of works all the way through. Um, and finally, OGS is open source. Um, it has many users and a great community. Uh, we are lucky to have good contact with our friends from Sweden and people from Norway. And every time we meet with them, we learn something new, even though we have a fairly big server because there's always another angle to do things that we did not consider. Uh, you tend to get snow blind thinking that the things you do are the perfect way to do it. And the present server could not be there without the good help from, from the Finnish uh, server, uh, journal.fi, because we quite simply were allowed to take their setup, uh, their homepage design, and use on our server. Uh, so we're quite happy that we're good friends with them. 
Now, the next question would be, why should libraries do this? A couple of years ago, I did count the, Dan the Nordic OTS servers as a sample to see who's working with this. I was quite new in the business and had no contacts, so I thought, why not count? And mostly university libraries and scientific societies are publishing, and actually, normally, it's university libraries, except in Finland, where it's a journal.fi, which is from a scientific society. And as far as I remember, Norway was a bit different, with more servers operate for one journal at the time. Most of the journals were from social science and humanities. That might have changed, but there was a clear tendency. And then we come to services. There were some platform providers like us, and then you had some professional publishers, um, like the one in Stockholm that has been established. And then you have a lot of services in between, where they, it seems like the people on the servers are more engaged in helping to find reviewers and, and things like that. Uh, and one day it could be quite interesting to, to try to describe why the journals and the platform providers choose different ways. But it's quite obvious when you talk to people that if you're a publisher, you have more rights to change things, like to choose what kind of uh, license that you can use, uh, if you can use Creative Commons or not. We are not able to do that because we are a platform provider. So the choices you make uh, give problems with the service you offer. Now, why use libraries? Well, we are used to give access to books, journals, and stuff like that. And we used to do it online. Um, so it, we are the people that they come to anyway. We are close contacts with the researchers uh, regarding publications to find where to publish your, uh, the articles. We better know about copyright, open access, and subscriptions. Uh, because if we don't do that, we can't do our work. And then librarians know about metadata uh, as experts. And then the libraries are often in close contact with IT departments because all our online services would not work anyway without the IT people. So it seems like the libraries, the university libraries, are the natural partners for, for works like this. Uh, you can find other departments at university, but they'll stand it'll still end up talking with us about a lot of these things. And just to conclude, our server has given access to Danish publications, uh, yearbooks and journals. Uh, I think we have something back to the 18th century, early 18th century. A lot of it would have been hard to find. Now we can really easily find it. Uh, we have assured that it could be accessed as open access. Our experience is that they start out with embargoes, but end up being immediate open access journals. They just have to get used to it. Um, and then we all realized that it's a service needed by the journals. They can't handle this themselves. How should they? They're scientists. They are supposed to focus on whatever topic they're working with, not about whether to have green open access or whatever. We will help them with that. And then OGS is perfect for the task. There might be other systems, I realize that. But, but it has worked for us um, all over the time. And most of the journals actually only use the quick submit solution and do not use the entire workflow. But the journals that use it um, are quite happy for doing that because they can document their work. So if an editor suddenly dies, they don't lose all the information. Uh, it's quite valuable for them. And well. As libraries, we're often seen as a perfect partner in this kind of work. And if you're not doing that already, I would really su suggest that you should start to do it. And my final slide. I am not working alone with this. Uh, we have my colleague in Copenhagen, uh, Kanri Iversen, uh, a lady uh, sitting in Copenhagen as well, Maya Ronne. She's working with IT. Then there's Nils Frederiksen, uh, who has been working with this thing before I started at the library. Uh, he's my personal hero. He just translated the whole system uh, into a Danish version of 3.2, which we are looking ahead to test now. And then we have our IT wizard guy, uh, Tom G. Christensen, who sort of, if something goes wrong, is able to you know, make things work. I had prepared for questions, but we'll take that later, I think. And some links. Um, the first one is for Tiska Deco, this journal.dk. 
Then we have uh, OMP focusing on Aarhus University, uh, where you can see our catalog. Um, and then we made a little journal called OGS in Danish, um, because we realized that we had to send out all the same information how to use the system many times. So we created the journal. And actually, it gave, gave us some experience, because we had to decide some things that like editors have to do. So we actually learned about how to operate a journal doing this. That's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are doing well to time, and my thanks to the speakers. Our final speaker is Max Haring, University of Amsterdam. We'll speak on University Journals, a collaborative open access publishing platform owned by universities and linked to repositories. So I suppose, again, um, a test for a microphone because it feels really awkward. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for, for having me. It's great to be able to present our, uh, our initiative, University Journals, to this audience. Um, it relates a lot to the things that have been discussed before. Um, library publishing, um, platforms, um, and not necessarily kind of university presses. Um, <coughs> So I, today I'd like to share the, the initial, the aims of the, uh, the project and where we wanted to go, um, kind of the, uh, the, the needs we identified, um, and, and, and looking at how a platform like University Journals, a shared publishing platform for journal-like publications owned by universities, how that could work. Um, the, the project itself is still in, in, in an investigation phase. So we're nearly ending the, uh, this investigation. So I've, I wrote a 70-page uh, report that will go back to the, the funders, but also to the partner universities. And at some point, they will have to decide um, if this will actually happen. So it, it's, it's not um, a done deal yet. Uh, but I have good hopes that we get, in some shape or form, we get some um, um, collaborative platform like University Journal set up um, in, the, in the very near future. And I will end this talk, by the way, with, the, um, uh, with a bit of a summary of lessons learned in this, uh, in this investigations phase. Um, so hopefully that might help you um, um, in, in your new projects uh, in, in the future as well. Uh, but I'd like to start with a quote from, uh, from the Scholarly Kitchen. I assume you all know the blog. Um, it's from, from some time ago. And, and the question to ask is, um, why hasn't academia taken back control of publishing? Of course, we all are aware of the problems with the large commercial publishers, the challenges around open access. And so it makes a lot of sense that libraries take, libraries, um, uh, universities, institutes, perhaps funders also, take back control of, um, uh, of publishing. Um, the article itself, by the way, goes into lengths describing the challenges around university presses. Um, and while that's all valid, I don't think that's, that's the right approach here. Um, because there are already so many examples of where academia actually has taken back control of publishing. Um, but it's, it's very often not in the form of a press. It's in the form of, of services, of platforms. Uh, and we, we as libraries are m much better equipped to provide services than to set up a press. At least that's what I'm... Uh, that's my opinion. So the, of course you all know how the French um, repository, which is linked um, overlay journal system, EpiSciences. Um, there's an Amsterdam initiative called SciPost, which is a physics set of physics journals um, that are linked to archive as, as use, basically they use archive as a submission system. Um, of course, there's a whole set of um, um, open source software, open source platforms and tools available. Um, so there, there's, there is actually a lot happening in, in academia. Um, around scholarly publishing. <coughs> so, University Journals was set up, um, was, the, it was conceived by a, uh, by a professor um, at the University of Amsterdam um, who saw really a need for a, a, a more flexible way of publishing with less constraints and less dependent on, on large commercial publishers. Um, so, as I said, we all know the, uh, the, the challenges with high costs, very slow move towards a 100% open access world. Um, and of course, at the time that he was um, um, starting this, there was still Plan S as, as the big changer that nobody knew about what it would actually be. This is more than a year ago. So by now, Plan S has been uh, uh, pretty much um, dealt with, and, and, and the rules are clear. But at the time, it was very uncertain what the effects would be. Um, so there was, there was another pressure to have our own journal, uh, our own platform, that we could control and we could make 
um, compliance to Plan S to Horizon 2020 to whatever rules um, funders might impose on the on the researchers, uh, without having to rely on on, on others, um, commercial entities, to do it for us. And of course, if you start thinking about publishing platforms, you, you, there is very easy to, to set up a wish list, right? Um, try more, publish more quickly, be flexible around article types, uh, types of content you can publish, to be really transparent, support open um, peer review, um, support version control, all those stuff. Um, of course, also one of the ambitions um, uh, from the DORA declaration is to move away from impact factors. Well, there's another thing where this, a platform like this could help. Um, so there, there, is, there, is, there is a huge set of, of, of things you could do if you have your own platform, basically. <coughs> um, so we, we started drawing a plan for, for universe journals. Um, and again, I would like to emphasize, it is not a university press. Um, there will be not be an editorial board. Um, there will not be um, impact factors, all that stuff. We really want to be, provide a service to researchers where they can publish their work relatively conveniently, relatively easy, um, um, a, 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 with low costs, um, and, and, but still with kind of a, a, a quality uh, control, quality aspects, uh, and, and a prestigious name to it. Um, so we have 13, partners, 13 university partners um, who signed up for the initial investigation of this project. Um, a lot of them are based in the Netherlands, but we have also have a few um, universities from, from Spain, um, from Zurich, uh, and, and from Sweden involved. Um, so the initial idea focused very much on a link with institu institutional repositories. Uh, there's a lot of content in repositories that could have been journal publications. Uh, why can't we have a system that can actually help researchers elevate those, those repository publications to, a, to kind of a published status? Um, actually, that, that part turned out to be, to be quite challenging. Um, and we, we've, we've turned, uh, tuned that down a bit in the, in the subsequent versions. Um, but it's still in the back of our minds, and it's still, still really um, trying to use repositories as well as journal platforms and linking them together, um, providing a, 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 a part of a, a, an open infrastructure for uh, academic publishing. And of course, it should be diamond open access, um, um, and then by that we mean we don't want to send invoices to researchers. So the cost should be paid by the institutes, by the participating institutes, perhaps by the funders, but definitely not by the researchers. <clears throat> and of course, as I said, it needs to comply with all the rules that are there right now, Horizon 2020, but also rules in the future, um, whatever Plan S comes up with next, um, and of course also the ambitions from the DORA declaration. <clears throat> and while we're at it, right, the ambitions are high here. Uh, um, we we also like to have the, the kind of um, um, help researchers more than just provide a platform where they can put their PDFs. Um, quality control is really important, but we know that peer review, as done traditionally by journals, is a very slow process. It's sometimes more a bit of a lottery, um, um, and it's, it's it's very inefficient. Um, so. If we, if we are designing a new platform, we, we better take peer review into account as well. Um, so if we've discussed with a lot of uh, our partners, with a lot of researchers, um, and we came up with, a, uh, with a, basically a two-tier strategy. Um, how this actually will work out is still something that, that needs to be discussed. Um, but we, we, what we want to do is to focus on a very quick baseline checks, quality checks, um, for, for submissions. Uh, done by the, uh, uh, the universities themselves, because in the end they attach their name to the publication, so they need to be responsible for the content. Um, this is not, not a proper peer review, right? It is not scientifically checked. This is um, metadata uh, checks, quality checks on the, on the content. Do we, do, do, do the, does the university know the person, know the researcher? Do they know the research? Was it funded? Um, and and if, if, if a paper passes all that, um, it can get published on the platform. So this means that, that any researcher who submits a decent work um, can be reasonably sure that it gets published, which is very different from a lot of journals with high rejection rates. Um, you never know. Um, but we also identified very strongly the need for traditional peer review um, for certain papers, for certain researchers in certain disciplines, it's, it's more than in others. Um, so we, th there definitely will be an option for to have traditional peer review as done by journals. Um, and taking into account it will just it will just take more time, um, but this is an option. 
um, an option that can be um, chosen by the authors, perhaps. Maybe the, the university wants to have it mandatory for certain types of research um, papers. Uh, um, if you actually describe research results, it probably needs um, peer review. If it's just a progress report, pr it probably does not re need review. Uh, a, a data report itself, does data report need traditional peer review um, or can it just have technical review? So we want to be um, very flexible there and only resort to the traditional slow peer review type when it's absolutely necessary. So the, this is a bit of how the platform could work, right? There's a researcher who will submit their work into the platform, um, but we also want, still want to have that link with the university repository. So if a paper is already in a repository but not published yet, um, with the click of a button, it should be able to transfer to, to the platform and, uh, and be submitted as a, as, a, as a publication. So at the platform, we will do the quality assurance step um, and the optional peer review step for, for certain types of papers. And, and if it passes all those checks, um, the articles can, can get published. Ideally, we also have some kind of post-publication review, re reader comments um, um, in there as well, although this, this creates a lot of technical challenges with version control um, and DUIs uh, uh, do not handle version controls very well. Um, so, um, so once, once the paper is published, we also want to put a lot of effort into dissemination because in the end, that, but that's what gets the readers to the, to the papers and that what adds value for the, for the researchers. So we will push content absolutely to Crossref, OpenAir, um, to Google, make sure it's in Google Scholar and basically set up any partnership we can find with um, with large indexes, uh, abstracting services, so they are aware of the content and, the, and the, 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 the researchers who publish on the platform know that actually the reach of their, their research is just as good as it would be with, with prestigious journals. <coughs> so the content itself, um, the, 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 the content platform itself should have an article first um, approach. We don't want to see actually journals, we want to see articles. Um, so, if people look, use Google or whatever search engine to, to look for research, um, why they end up is the article page itself. They shouldn't end up in this volume and issue um, lists. Uh, we, we don't want to see those. Those are all, all they will be there, but in the background. Um, we, we really want to, to have um, an article first, research first presentation. Um, and of course, because it's all online, we can, we can, we can filter and, and allow searches in all kinds of different ways um, on institute level, in university level, topics, keywords, um, basically anything. If, if a reader wants to see only peer-reviewed work and not see the only the, the QA um, but not peer-reviewed work, that should be a setting as well. So we are really transparent about what happens to a particular paper. Um, and because it's all online, we can be very flexible with kind of collections who have themed issues, but then virtual, um, even across different institutes, across different uh, uh, topics, um, uh, whatever is, is topical at the moment, or what, what, if there's a conference, uh, we can have the conference papers as a, as a collection. Um, so you can have very quickly set up a new journal just for one conference, close the journal again after a month because all the conference papers are in. Um, so the, the, the platform should allow that, should be, allow very flexible uh, use of, of kind of the journal medium. So this is how an article page could look. So very prominently we will display the, 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 the institute or the university um, or the research school. The, I mean, the, again, we, have, we tend to be flexible there. Um, but whatever, it, it should be a prestigious um, brand. The idea is that the, uh, the journal brand um, which is now important and gives a bit of quality that is replaced by the, the branding of the institute or the university itself. Um, so um, readers know kind of the quality they, they, uh, they expect from, uh, from, from looking at the branding here. So uh, we will be very um, f uh, uh, transparent about what happens to that particular paper as well. So if it, it, everything is quality reviewed, so it will get a kind of a sticker or a badge saying this was quality reviewed. If it was peer reviewed, traditional peer review, it will get another bad badge or sticker saying it was peer reviewed. If there is data available, you can imagine there will be another badge saying, hey, download the data here. Um, so we really try to be as transparent as possible towards the readers about what happened to that particular paper. So the, uh, as I said, we, 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 we aim to set up this platform with a lot of different partners and a lot of different institutes. Um, 
So they will all be able to get their little home basically on the platform itself. So readers who want to see only the works from the University of Barcelona, just click on that link and they will see the, the entire um, list of papers from, coming from that particular university. But the same you can do for, uh, for disciplines like social sciences. You click on the social sciences link, you will see everything published in social sciences across all the partners. Um, universities themselves get a lot of flexibility ag again to, uh, to highlight certain papers, to group things into collections, to into virtual journals. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways in which uh, universities can present their, uh, their research uh, on the platform. So we've, we've looked at uh, um, uh, the requirements for, um, for platforms like this. Um, and, 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 and talking with all the partners and, and have meetings and, and, and everything else, we, we can basically came up with, with three requirements. Um, first, and, and the most challenging probably, is it needs to be competitively priced against um, uh, commercial journals and ideally be, be less expensive. Uh, um, it also needs to be customizable. Um, we, we want to have a lot of flexibility. Um, but, but again, dealing with libraries who do not necessarily have experience actually handling um, editorial workflows. It also needs to be low maintenance. So we looked at, at um, in more in detail, um, uh, four different uh, uh, available platforms. So the, uh, um, we looked at uh, developing our own platform based on open journal systems in this case. Um, but we also looked at kind of off-the-shelf solutions. Uh, we looked at a commercial repository platform, a commercially available also traditional university press platform. Um, and kind of one of the modern journal platforms. And, and um, after the talk, I'm happy to share the, the brands uh, if you're interested in, in where we actually looked at. Um, uh, but, but interestingly, actually, the, the top one, um, the developing our own platform based on open journal systems, turned out to be the most expensive option if you look at development costs. It, it would a very long development time, quite significant development costs. Um, the bottom option, where you just take an off-the-shelf um, commercial provider with an open access platform, that one is the, by far the cheapest to start with. Of course, in the long run, and if you, if you um, start to publish any volume, um, open source is by far the cheapest to run um, and, to, oh, and, to publish, uh, um, and, and to publish a lot of papers. Um, then the, uh, the commercial open access platform becomes actually quite expensive. Um, the two in, in, in between are, are kind of comparable in costs, um, but to me, they, 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 they tend to look kind of old-fashioned and m very much like an old-fashioned type of university press, and that's not the, the image we want to, uh, we want to convey. Um, so this is where we are. We, we, we made this comparison. Um, we, we compared budgets and, 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 uh, um, uh, and wish lists for these, uh, these available platforms. And the big question now, back to going back to the partners, is if, if any of these options that we've, uh, we've looked at in, in detail um, is, is suitable for the partners to, uh, to actually approve and start developing and setting up the uh, University Journals platform. Um, so that, that's still an open question. I don't have an answer that um, year there. But looking at these platforms, looking at a lot of other platforms, it turns out, again, it's one of those triangles where you have three options and you can pick two. Um, you can have low costs and low effort, but that means you have to take something that's completely off the shelf. Um, if you have, want to have a, a lot of control about the workflow and low effort, you need to pay a lot for it. So, right, it's, it's one of those things. Um, I suppose the perfect platform doesn't exist. Um, so. As promised, I, I finishing off with some lessons learned. Um, it turned out that we we came up with the name University Journals because, um, looking from the perspective of a reader, we want the reader to understand that whatever is published in this on this platform is a final publication. It's not a repository publication. It's not a preprint server. It should be considered a final reviewed publication. Uh, but it turned out that the name Journals. Um, when talking with librarians, actually gave, gave a lot of uh, confusion about the, the, the actual means and, uh, and scope of the project. Um, also, when we started here, um, Plan S was, was this big unknown thing um, hanging over it, everybody's heads. Um, and a lot of doom and, and, and other scenarios were discussed. Um, by now, Plan S kind of settled down, the dust got settled, um, it, maybe it, gets, get, it got a bit less strict than it initially was initially presented. So it seems that the urgency for Plan S um, um, solutions is slightly less, which also means that for some partners, there's less urgency to actually go with us and, and start university journals, which is a pity. Um, 
There's, again, there's also um, a lot of different forms of publishing that needs inclusion. So the, of course, the, the questions come up, what about books? What about, what about media? Um, for the project right now, we decided to, to focus on kind of journal-like publications, basically anything we can fit into a PDF. Um, but of course, that's not where you want to end. Um, you, you want to have a flexible platform there. Um, and finally, there is, a, um, there is definitely um, overlap between what repositories do, appropriate servers do, um, um, scholarly networks do, um, university presses do, and, and how does something like university journals try to fit in there, um, not being any, very clearly any of those. Uh, which is in interesting, and I think it's a challenge, and I think it's an opportunity to, uh, um, um, to maybe perhaps to change a bit. But it's, uh, it's, it makes kind of selling the, the, the idea um, a, a bit more difficult. Um, but finally, we, we and, and I think that's the whole message of this morning, basically. We definitely need more platforms controlled by academia. Um, and that's the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have some time for discussion, so I'm going to ask the presenters to come back to the platform together. We can share microphones and see what we have to say. While they're doing that, um, we had neglected to mention earlier that there is a Twitter feed associated with this meeting. It's hashtag LibPub2020. Jane, nod to me when I say that. LibPub2020. Hashtag LibPub2020. Uh, capitalization doesn't matter. Um, so, anyway, welcome back. Thank you all for your presentations. Let me start by asking, and we can share some microphones here, um, if any of you have questions or comments for each other, because you're, I understand, no technical experts in sight here anywhere, <laughs> but you are the experts on this who've been talking about it. Would you have anything to say or comment? Yes. So I have a question actually for Cheryl, because I've been interested in Vega for a long time, since you first teased it like two years ago or something, so it's very exciting. Is there a journal or some, th some, some type of publication already that we could like look at to see like what the publish end of it like looks like yet, or is that still in the works? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and I was, went back to my seat and going, ah, oh, I should have shown that. Uh, <laughs> it's too much to show. Um, Yes, and I can show you sort of, uh, I've got a demo version that I can show you that has this journal called Borrowers and Lenders. Um, it's a multimedia Shakespeare journal out of University of Georgia. We've been using them as sort of our major test case. Um, I don't have their front end ready, but I do have a different front end. Um, the front end has been uh, one of the last things that we were working on because we're trying to get the other stuff ready. But, uh, but there's a lot of different parts that I can definitely show you. I have a question for bo probably both Cheryl and Ali. Um, so do you assign DUIs to your papers? DUIs. DUIs, digital object identifiers, registered with Crossref. Uh, and how do you put in your metadata into Crossref in that case? Um, we plan on doing that. We haven't gotten that far yet. Yes. Um, so for uh, bibliographies, actually we use uh, we use data site instead of Crossref because that's what our institution paid for. Um, but yes, so we um, register a DOI for the entire bibliography publication. We register a DOI for our entire topical web portal publications. For our monographs, we register DOIs for the like book itself, and then also all of the individual chapters. Um, yeah, so I think that. And did you want like specifics on how we enter that information? Mostly it's by hand and we just fill out as much as we can, unfortunately. And we're trying to determine whether we add DOIs for the individual media assets. Um, that's always been a question, but that of course gets very quickly into rising costs. <laughs> um, I do have one question and then we'll throw it open. What's the hardest part? of what you've done? What, what's most difficult? What's most frustrating? When do you want to just give up and make somebody else do it? I'm so glad, actually, to have somebody from PKP here, because for 15 years, I was like, I will not build a content management system that I'm then going to have to John Walensky, right? <laughs> like, John is amazing, and he's done so much beautiful work with open journal systems, but I didn't want to be that person. Uh, and then here I am finding myself in that position. Um, and so the hardest part that they've done incredibly well, and of course, they've been doing this for 20 plus years, is building the community. 
Um, I would say one of the hardest things is was learning Drupal and learning to speak like a developer in some ways. So again, caveat, I'm not, but learning to be able to have those questions, like have those discussions and, you know, know enough about the system and the way that people talk about it to be able to have intelligent questions and figure out this is what I actually mean when I say that I'm using this. Um, I'm also very fortunate that the people that I work with at the libraries are super kind and very willing to explain, you know, how things work and so that I fully understand kind of all of the jargon and all of the functionality and whatnot, but that's probably one of the largest barriers. Okay, for the floor, uh, questions here. We do have a microphone, we'll come around to you and the folks on streaming want to hear you, so wait for that. Go ahead. Mike. Thanks, I have a question for Marisa McDonald. Um, do you have, uh, have, you, have you thought much about the cloud? the cloud as an infrastructure of the internet. And do you have in Canada something which could be called a public cloud? Um, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, in terms of, do you have anything more? Uh, we have thought about it. I'm not actually here to represent necessarily. I'm here to talk about contributing and the stories from our community. So I can't speak too, too much on the software itself necessarily. But um, yes, we do. Um, in terms of, of the software uh, utilizing the cloud, is that your question? Um, I, I probably wouldn't be the best person to comment on that today. But uh, for now, it's a, it's, a, it's a download. It is a desktop version. So. Um, I'm too new to say, but I would say no, it's not in the works at the moment. I guess I could put this question also to the other speakers that uh, when we speak about the platform for publishing, so, uh, and we come to questions of the infrastructure of the internet and open infrastructure, as you said, then the question about uh, the cloud uh, gets interesting and and what is the uh, which cloud um, is going to be used by um, for example the vega system yeah i i'm 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 having a hard time um trying to understand what it is about the cloud that you want to ask. Are you asking about like cloud hosting services like Amazon or okay. Google or? Yes. Okay, and who's using like which, like how do we decide, how do we decide which cloud services we're going to use? Uh, the answer to your questions is yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and these are, one could say proprietary clouds owned by uh, yeah. corporations. So then, yeah, so like with, I don't want to monopolize. Do you want to answer first? <laughs> I'm probably the least uh, qualified person here to answer that. Well, so, okay. I mean, f from what a lot of us in the room know about open journal systems, if I may also yeah. answer for that, is that, you know, that was a, that was a mint, originally to be uh, downloaded and used on independent library servers, right? But now they offer the publishing services option, which probably is cloud, actually there's two different versions, right, that PKP has. There's the cloud hosted version, and then there's the, the library hosted version at Simon Fraser, I believe. And you, you all have, may have changed this in the last two years. Look at me answering for her. This is so rude. I'm so sorry. But because we use that as a case study for our own work, right? That's why I, I looked into this. Because then Vega has to decide, are we going to be hosted by Wayne State University's computing infrastructure locally, or are we going to be hosted using Amazon? And the system was built initially for our purposes using Amazon as sort of the test case knowing that we would also probably host it locally. So we want to be able to offer all of those different versions. And if our own institution at Wayne State, if we outgrow 
their computing capabilities, Vega can scale up to the cloud overnight, right? So that we can use both potential services. Now, whether we choose between Amazon or Google or Jupyter or whatever might come next, we, we haven't gotten that far ourselves, but others may speak to that. Well, we use it down loads uh, variation when I started. And I think we'll continue to do that because it gives us more control to add it, to make it work together with all of our other systems. And then there are some heavy GDPR problems with a user base with 15,000 people to just give that up to somebody else. So I think we'll continue to have the installation in our house. Yep, thank you for very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I think uh, Marisa said, uh, referred to Mind the Gap with uh, uh, 52 open source uh, platforms. Uh, I don't need that many. If they are, if they are uh, there must be differences. And I understand that if you want to publish bibliographies and uh, topical web pages, Drupal is a good uh, solution if you want to publish with a lot of multimedia, Vega might be an option. So it's important to know the differences between the platforms. And then I have a very, <coughs> very concrete uh, question to Jesper. Tidskrift Deco, is that funded by the Royal uh, Library as a part of the, their mission as a national library? Well, that's a long story, but yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, it is funded by the Royal Library, but, but over the time we had some agreements with other universities that they had to pay a sum for each journal that is published on the server. Uh, the server now is a result of a merger of two servers with different policies, and we sort of have to develop a complete, unique, unified uh, policy for the server. So there are some journals that are paid a very symbolic sum for. But again, we say no to journals if we don't think they are Danish or scientifically uh, yeah. appropriate. But do you think it's a good idea for a national library to take up a service like uh, hosting uh, journals well, like you well, do? Yes, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Here, please. Um, yeah, oh, that's loud. Uh, I've got a question for Max. I'm from the University of Oslo and um, my experiences with our editorial team, so we, I'm involved in hosting and running a journal publishing service. Um, our editorial teams are very closely wedded to the peer review process. So I was intrigued with when you were describing the quality checking process as opposed to full peer review. Uh, have you discussed that with the academic communities and what sort of feedback? Because a lot of my researchers would be very negative to something like that. Yeah. I, I Good question, um, and we absolutely discussed this. And interestingly, you get about a 50-50 split. Um, half thinks it will never work. Everybody needs peer review. And the other half thinks, this is amazing, we need that. <laughs> so there's... Um, it, it, it is not for everything, right? If, if, you, if you have your research papers um, describing new findings, you, you will need peer review. Um, but there is so much more that could be published, and that's now published in repositories or on websites or as reports that could be part of kind of academic literature. Um, just it just does, doesn't need to be peer reviewed. And University Journals aims to be a platform for those um, types of publications as well. So there, I'm, I'm absolutely um, I'm confident that we can um, rely on quality assurance only and not do peer review and still provide a, a, a high quality publication. Hi, I'm Nils Lalem from the Scandinavian University Press. Uh, although it's called University Press, we're a private company um, with a long history of, of close cooperation with, uh, with uh, the university sector in Norway and Scandinavia. But uh, uh, as a private company, we, um, uh, and often politicians, uh, argue that uh, uh, a private competition will give better use uh, of public money uh, than uh, a state-run economy, and this is obviously state-run. Uh, so, and we have some considerations of quality as well. Um, and of course, we we uh, um, use a lot of time to work on uh, on uh, the researcher um, needs and the uh, and the librarian's needs, for example, in our, our publishing platforms. Uh, so, the question would be um, uh, maybe first and foremost to 
to tidskrift.dk because that's very close to what we publish, uh, national uh, and Scandinavian and Nordic journals. But maybe to all of you, um, uh, what are the costs so far uh, for uh, your uh, platform solutions and uh, how do you see the costs uh, and budgets uh, going forward? Well, we haven't kind of, uh, I haven't looked into the economy, but we're using, I think, three full man hours, man, man employees a year uh, to operate the server. And then there's some technical issues with hardware, and then we pay for DOIs. So in our budget, it's not that much. Um, but I think your next question would be whether it should be public or private. Uh, some of our journals actually have moved to private servers as well. I said some have moved to Allborg, and some have moved to publishers that so they could make a business out of it. And then we don't own the journals, so if somebody comes and says, I want to move to your server, it's not a problem for us. Uh, it's, it's the editorial boards that need to find the money to do that. Could I, could I just maybe uh, comment on that? Because we have had several journals that uh, we have been in discussions with that had gone to tscript.dk. And uh, they have said, we would really, really like to come to you, but you cost money and tscript.dk is free. And then, so that's, yeah, and then they go to you, of course. They, yeah, so it's, uh, the quality is not that important when it comes to competing against free, so. I understand your problem. That's why we don't offer all the services that a true publisher would do. Uh, we're quite deliberate about that. So if they want to have that, they need to go to a, a true publisher. That's, that's natural for us to say. We tell them each time when they come, you must be aware we do not do all this a publisher does. And I feel like underlying your question is an issue of political economy instead, right? And the moral value of open access and academy-owned work that if we're, good, if we're dumping our Elsevier subscriptions, like my university pays $9 million a year for a very poor urban institution that doesn't have $9 million a year for big deals and, and bundled subscriptions, then library publishing is one way to solve the access issue for our researchers. And then, then it doesn't come down to the economy of how many people we're employing to do this work or what the necessary levels of equal economy are because we're not in a, a commercialized system. Okay, we have to close with that. Please join me in thanking our presenters for a very interesting morning. Thank you. There will now be the necessary technical pause while we make the connection to Australia. Yes, yeah, sorry. I just had it on mute while I wasn't speaking, so you didn't get any background noise. I think you're just going to take your mic off. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Good. Oh, sorry, it's not my speaker. I can always hear you. I'm just muting my microphone when I'm not talking, just so that if there's any background noise, because I'm at home, then my background noise doesn't filter through. But I can hear when it's my speakers, when my microphone's muted. Well, yes, good morning and welcome to Oslo. Um, the weather here is somewhat different than it probably is in Brisbane, uh, but we're happy to have you here. Uh, your slide presents you, Elena Danilova and Kathleen Smeaton, Publication Density Problem, publishing, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, publishing to bring attention to your work. 
Ladies, go ahead, please. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, good morning to you and good evening to us uh, here in Australia. So I would like to briefly introduce myself. Uh, um, my name is Elena Danilova and I'm a manager of digital learning and publishing. And the second speaker tonight is Kathleen. Hi everyone, I'm Kathleen Smeaton. I'm the Associate Director of Data, Digital Learning and Publishing at UQ Library. And good morning to you, as Elena said, from um, a very warm summer evening in Brisbane. Yeah, well, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about publication density as a problem and what the library is actually doing in order to bring attention to the work of our researchers. All right, hopefully we are going to go with no major um, problems. All right, so uh, first of all, we wanted to uh, explain a little bit about what what do we understand by publication density? And there's a few facts uh, on the slides which you hopefully can see. So um, if you're looking um, in 2014, there were more than 28,000 active scholarly peer-reviewed journals. Uh, in 2009, we actually were able to pass a 50 million mark in terms of the total number of science paper published from 1665. Um, in addition to that, uh, some research suggests that um, there's 2.5 million articles that, publish, that is published every year. And uh, according to some other research, this number actually doubles every nine years. And to add to the problem, um, the worldwide scientists, the number of worldwide active publishing scientists is increasing at the rate of approximately four to five percent per year. Um, this particularly becomes a bit problematic in research intensive university, which University of Queensland is. There's a little bit of data here on the slide. Uh, we just wanted to um, showcase that we are um, number one in Australia based on the nature index um, indicators. Um, we bring, the, the researchers actually bring more than $300 million in research funding to the university. You see that there is 95% of UQ research is above world standard, and that data is based on the results of ERA, which stands for Excellence in Research for Australia. So basically it's uh, like an assessment uh, framework. Um, and um, if you look a little bit down, you can see that in, in 2019, last year, we've actually uh, awarded 765 PhDs. Um, in 2019, um, the researchers actually contributed around 12,000 publications in recognized journals. So um, it's, it's a big number. Um, well, now, <laughs> How do people actually come across research publications? There are different discovery pathways and um, library content discovery prep platforms that are improving um, is a fantastic way to find published research. But at the same time, all the various internet searching engines are becoming more and more sophisticated. So people are now able to search for data sets um, and not only published research, but published data as well. Um, also open science and open access publishing is increasingly becoming more uh, like a norm in scientific research community. And um, the researchers have precious, um, some sort of precious on being able to bring attention to their research. So um, they need to showcase uh, impact and engagement of their research with general public and um, um, you know, industry and so on. So, uh, and more to the point, actually repositories, publisher websites, uh, collaborative platforms, they, they provide an opportunity for researchers to um, use social media share buttons and you know in that way disseminate research or bring attention to their research um, very proactively. So 
all of these factors uh, combined actually uh, are rapidly increasing the volume of potentially relevant material that others come across when they conduct their own research. And potentially all of this is contributing to the information overload. And obviously, as good librarians, where we see the problem, we try to find solutions. So um, what do we do um, in our library is we try to connect readers to the published scholarly works. And for that, we um, use or we create various forms of engaging content and data visualizations so that um, people can have this interactive content retrieval. So how do we do that? We collaborate with authors of published works. Um, we interrogate different systems, and we also uh, help researchers produce video abstracts to bring attention to their published work and increase that discovery. So uh, I think the next slide, in the next slide, I'm going to um, run a small um, sort of visualization uh, that uh, represents a, a project which Kathleen will talk about after we play this. It's about 30 seconds and hopefully technology will be with us. Right. So what that video that we just played was showing was a visualization that we had done up and you can see on the slide there that had all the sort of the, like a network visualization map. And what we were trying to do is show people, help people find another way to find open access research that we have in our institutional repository. So a lot of um, talk in Australia around open access at the moment and I know in Europe with Plan S there's a lot of discussion around that as well and one of the things that we were encouraging researchers to do and also just general members of our community is to engage with open access research in a new way and uh, institutional repositories such as the one we've got is called eSpace even though they're hugely important they're not always the um, nicest way to discover materials because you're really just searching on keywords and things like that which is you know obviously there's a place for that type of search but one of the things that we were looking at doing is just how do you find things a bit with a bit of serendipity so like in the old days you'd be browsing on the shelf you'd see a book you'd look at a book next to it and you just happen to find it we thought we would try and bring that into a data visualization so that people could discover this open access content in a new way. So really what we did there is people could search for a keyword and then they'd be able to view related keywords in that sort of network map. They could zoom in and out and kind of go on their own journey of discovery to find other articles that interested them. And then that would just go straight through to VQ eSpace, which is our institutional repository, to enable them to read the associated uh, publications. But the idea was it was just a new way for people to engage with a lot of the content that is in the repository in a way that was a bit more engaging than just searching by keywords. Okay, well, um, when it comes to video abstracts, that's um, probably a lot more self-explanatory, but um, how how the video abstracts are useful is um, that they actually drive more engagement again with published research. And uh, currently, I don't think a lot of publishers are offering this as an option that a video abstract actually goes alongside with uh, the published article. But uh, Wiley is one of the publishers offering this as an option for about you know slightly over seventeen hundred US dollars, in addition to other costs. And um, according to their statistics, um, the, these, the articles that go to in line with uh, video, video abstracts have 447% higher altmetric attention score and 111% higher full text views. So um, 
Another thing that needs to be mentioned is video abstracts is an easy way for um, and an easy format for the mainstream media to engage with, um, easy to share in social media, and um, it's probably a little bit more engaging than you know for uh, general public, um, not only academic community, because it has that sort of you know middle ground between academic language and sometimes academic jargon and um, the laid back sort of, you know, language that we encourage researchers to use. We work together with researchers on their script and then uh, organize um, through another unit within the university, professional filming, um, making sure that, you know, all the um, UQ um, sort of, you know, UQ, uh, logos and everything is up to date. Okay, and uh, I'm going to play a video abstract right now just to showcase what we actually mean by that. Um, and I apologize, there may be a little bit of delay in terms of the sound. Did you know that malnutrition affects approximately 50% of residents in Australian aged care homes? Hi, I'm Danielle Cave and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Queensland School of Human Movement and Nutrition Sciences. In Australia, there is currently no best practice model for the delivery of food fortification strategies across the menu in aged care homes for residents who are malnourished or who are small eaters. My research focuses on developing best practice models for nutrition in Australian aged care homes, specifically through food fortification. Food fortification is the addition of ingredients to make foods and beverages more energy and nutrient dense without increasing the portion size. It is a common strategy as part of the food first approach, which involves increasing nutritional intake through food. As part of my research, I conducted a review of 17 studies to explore the relationships between food fortification strategies, mode of delivery and sustainability in aged care homes. None of the included studies looked at strategies to embed food fortification within the food service system or identified staffing needs and concerns. Only two of the 17 studies measured any aspect of the costs associated with food fortification. The analysis of these studies showed that there are no clear sustainable strategies for implementing food fortification in aged care homes. However, I have identified potential enablers for sustainability, including choosing low-cost ingredients that are easy to use, which would minimise the costs associated with staff time. It was also beneficial to allocate a staff member to act as a nutrition champion, a person who supports and advocates for the nutritional care of residents. There are some potential barriers to the sustainable delivery of food fortification strategies. These include a lack of data about the comprehensive costs of these strategies, the availability of fortified foods for residents post-intervention, and the continuation of a nutrition champion long-term. Malnutrition is a critical issue in Australian aged care homes and is the business of all staff and service providers. What all aged care homes should be implementing is a comprehensive food fortification program for residents who are malnourished or those that could be at risk, such as the small eaters. Food fortification is a great strategy to prevent and treat malnutrition, but we need to investigate ways to support the sustainable implementation of food fortification within the food service system. As my research continues, I plan to look further at enablers for sustainability. Thanks for watching this video. For more information on my research, please read my article, Can Food Services in Aged Care Homes Deliver Sustainable Food Fortification Strategies? A review in the International Journal of Food Sciences and Nutrition. Um. 
we were able to create this video um, in November. So uh, the journal, which was Taylor and Francis, allowed uh, uh, an abstract to go together with the publication. And since then, um, the article received uh, around like over 400 uh, views. And uh, there is an altmetric score of six. And um, since this uh, is a relatively new um, initiative, I guess. Even the publishers don't, we believe, don't quite know how to uh, use it for the benefit of researchers. So this particular video was on placed on Vimeo by the journal. And uh, we know uh, that currently Altmetrics uh, is only looking at the information in YouTube. So in addition to that, we've placed this video on YouTube. And um, Danielle, this researcher, has already received quite a lot of uh, attention um, and her research was um, sort of uh, looked at. A, a number of organizations reached out and are willing to see how this research is going to progress so that they can um, take the benefits from that research and improve uh, aged care homes uh, in regards to nutrition. Well, that is... Uh, basically all from us. So if you have any questions, we'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Let me just check. Can you hear me from this microphone? I think we have to actually talk to the computer. Here. Talk to the computer. <laughs> Yes, we can. All right. I will repeat questions from the audience as they are. Go on. Oh, um, I will repeat questions from the audience as they are asked. So if there are questions, please. Questions, comments. <laughs> well, I, I'm absolutely blown away, wowed by this presentation. And I wonder if you could ask what the level of effort and cost and time is in producing one. So the question is, what is the level of cost and effort and time involved in producing either one visual abstract or a series for authors in your institution? Well, uh, I'll, I'll take on this question. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, we provide intensive training. So uh, through the program uh, in collaboration with uh, our graduate school, um, we provide introduction to video abstracts so that um, our researchers are familiar with uh, what it's all about and, and why it can be useful to engage with this type of communication. And um, then we have a separate uh, training session, which is actually a workshop with hands-on. So we um, explain to researchers how to prepare a script. We provide them with a template, which is really highly structured. So when they come to that workshop, they're actually ready. And uh, we also do a little bit of um, you know, training them how to actually hold themselves you know, in front of the camera um, and how to uh, read from the teleprompt and, and so on and so forth. So we give them these valuable uh, tips of how to go through the filming process as well as create video abstract scripts for video abstracts. So we do, as a library, we look through the scripts and, and um, give suggestions what needs to be changed. Um, and Danielle's abstract, very frankly, took just one week from the time when she submitted her first script and, and uh, to the time it was actually complete and, and fully um, finished. So it might be a while before all 12,000 UQ articles in a year <laughs> uh, have these. That's, that's correct. <laughs> I think... Um, Obviously, yes, it is quite labour intensive, so it will be a while. And I think that there are, as this becomes more sophisticated and researchers realise the value, there are probably going to be some articles that are more suitable for video abstracts. So we are imagining that um, 
within schools and faculties, they might be selecting certain, you know, high profile bits of research or research that they might think ha will have a big impact that they would like a video abstract made for because it, it would be impossible um, to, to do them all. For, for me, it seems like it was a lot of efforts to make this uh, visual abstract, but uh, and of course it's a threshold for making the first visual abstract. But I guess uh, it's important for us to to just tell the researchers that they will have to prepare for being able to make it, to make visual abstracts in the future for everything that they do. A comment from our host Lars that uh, the first out of the box will have to be difficult and take some effort, but faculty will get used to the idea. Um, you make me remember Lars, the colleague who 35 years ago made fun of laser printers and the people who had gotten laser printers and were playing with fonts. And the same man five years later said to me, I don't know why any of these young people putting out their resumes don't have the sense to use a laser printer. <laughs> Change happens. <laughs> any other questions for our Australian visitors? Yes. We have one. Uh, how advanced is, is the technical equipment? Do you need a special studio for, for this? Or, uh... Question is, how advanced is the technical equipment? Do you need a special studio for this? Uh, yes, you do. So um, if you really want to produce high quality videos, um, you do need to have studios. And we are well equipped as a university. So we have Institute of Teaching and Learning Innovation uh, who are looking to embed you know, videos of all sorts you know, into their education process. So, and we are able to have these studios available for us where we need them. The equipment and teleprompters and screens and everything is that's involved in producing the video. And there change happens in my institution. We have just renovated our main building and in the new library, there are three small studios, two of them half the size of the stage which are meant for faculty and students to use for whatever purposes, they would adapt perfectly. I'm going to go home and think about whether we can do something like this, uh, whether we can do yeah. something like this now with that central, that central facility. Yeah. So. And that's our hope too, I guess, you know, so we are giving uh, the training sessions, uh, are focusing on pre um, developing the content, being able to um, engage with um, you know, the camera and use teleprompters and work with the script and um, being able to perform, you know, in front of the camera, which is also um, can be quite challenging. So we are hoping as we increase the awareness and, and people are trying, so maybe they will be advanced enough to be able to produce videos themselves of, you know, really high quality. Good. Well, thank you. I don't know at what time bedtime arrives in Australia, but <laughs> lunchtime, lunchtime has arrived here. So I think we will thank you and uh, very much for your presentation and the stimulation uh, thank, and wish you, you a good you. night and, uh, and conclude now. So thank you. Please join me in thanking our guests. So now I think lunch is served just outside here. And um, we have one hour lunch, okay? Thank you very much.
Testing me. Yeah, I hope you have uh, had a good lunch and are ready for a new session. Before we go to the new session, I, I just would like to present two persons who have done most of the work with this conference, and that is Gry Moxnes and Emma uh, Westley. And Guri has a lot of experience with uh, organizing conferences with uh, Norwegian uh, conferences for academic librarians, the International Lea Tool Conference, and this and all this conference. And Emma, she uh, has been working with publishing for many years, but uh, started the last fall as the head of our knowledge management uh, systems in the university library. Then we are ready for the next, uh, next session, and um, Maria O'Neill is going to share that. Thank you, guys. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, just a few thank yous. I'd just like to thank Lars and his team for the delicious lunch and for their wonderful hospitality. Um, and also thanks to Jim and the fantastic speakers this morning. I'm, I'm sure you will agree it was a really interesting and enriching session with lots more to come. So we are now moving along to case studies and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Sue Ann Gardner of the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And Sue Ann's talk is um, wonderfully inspiring in terms of its title, Small But Mighty, How a Team of Four Administers a Robust Library Publishing Programme. Thank you, Suan. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you for introducing me and for being here. I have the after lunch a slot here, so I'm going to try to perk everybody up. Um, so yes, small but mighty. I, I prepared way too much for this, so I'm going to speed through it. Apologies if it's too quick. These will be online if you need to see them afterward. And uh, if you have questions, just contact me anytime. I, I love to talk about this. So. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My co-author on this is Paul Royster. He isn't here with me today, and, um, but he helped me prepare this, so this is our talk. Uh, UNL Repository and Publishing Program. UNL is University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'll soon show you on a map where we are. I'm going to give you a quick overview. We're a state land-grant university, um, so it's a, a public university. And we're a Research One Carnegie designated university, meaning it's a very high research output. We're the largest library in the state and the largest uh, academic library in the state, of course, too. We have about 26,000 students. Uh, we're in this particular academic alliance, and uh, our mascot is the Corn Huskers. So this is where we are in the country, really in the middle of the country. We're not coastal or, uh, you know, Gulf there. So that's Nebraska. Um, we have over 109,000 items, full text items in our repository. We've had 62 million downloads of our work, uh, 8.2 million in the past year alone. We have over 80 scholarly monographs, nine original journal titles, and several mirror titles. Uh, 15,000 of those 109 full text, 1,000 full text items are ETDs, electronic theses and dissertations, and there's our URL. Um, 
So how have we done this? We were two for a long time. From 2005 to 2014, it was Paul Royster and I working on this together. I came on board in 2008. In 2014, we were able to add a third person. And it's a fun story to talk about how we acquired her, but I, do, I don't really have time. But the short version of it is that she and Paul worked together at the University of Nebraska Press, and they were both rift which is a kind way of saying they were, they were let go uh, in a downsizing event. And it was to our advantage. We were able to acquire them in the library. What I'm going to talk about today, some of it is idiosyncr idiosyncratic, meaning it's particular to our instance. It doesn't necessarily translate into other instances, but some of these are key and probably do translate in, uh, more generally. So here are some clues about how we've done what we've done. Some of the principles that we operate under are these. So the repository, we think, is a publisher beyond anything else. It's not a collection. It's not an archive. We think of it as a set of services. This is from Cliff Lynch of CNI, Coal Coalition for Networked Information. Um, it says that this is one uh, way that you can come at repositories, and this is how we do it. Our works are provided, the works that we provide are access copies. So we don't think of these as preservation. We try to shovel content onto the web so that people can read things for free. We have all kinds of um, uh, reuse uh, policies that cover this. It's not an OA repository. It's, it's an institutional repository with lots of different um, copyright uh, material. Um, copyright regime. Okay, so the workflows for the material types are all very similar. So that's one reason we can do what we do. So we have the repository, we have a publishing program that does journals and books, and we have open educational resources. And the reason we can do this all the same is because we the workflows are very similar. And like I said, public access is what guides us more than anything else. I'm going to bring in Raghunathan here uh, throughout the talk. And books are for use. And that's the way we think about it. We want to get books out there for people to use however they need them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our staff. We do have four of us. Uh, Paul is our coordinator. I'm the scholarly communications librarian. We have a metadata person. And Linnea is our copy editor. And how we got, came to be is just random. This was not like a crack, a crack team that was was created. This is the Island of Misfit Toys from uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. This is a television program that's shown in the United States every year for the fa past 50 years. And these are the unwanted toys. We just sort of fell in together, and we became a very dynamic team. And I think that it was a benefit that we weren't kind of constructed. You know, It was more organic. And uh, we got along well with each other, which really helped. OK, so here we are, pictures of us uh, in our best form, I guess. But um, what I want to say about us is there's no hierarchy here. The, the uh, images in a linear fashion is, is intentional. Paul is not our leader. I'm not our leader. Margaret's not. And Linnea's not. We all work together co-leading. So some relevant characteristics that make us work well together. We all have a very strong public service motivation. Linnea was working for IBM when, when she came on board. And she couldn't wait to get away from there. It wasn't for her. We said, you'll have to take a pay cut. You know, We work really hard, and this and that. She said, sign me up. Two of us are from a publishing background. Paul was a CEO or CFO or something at Library of America. They had a $5 million budget when he left. Um, and that's a scholarly pub publishing venture in the United States. And he worked for Yale University Press. Linnea is from the University of Nebraska Press. Margaret and I are career librarians. And we feel very fortunate to be working with these amazing people. They taught us everything they know. We do have a very industrious disposition. I wanted to say, not to say we're workaholic. It's just that if you're going to think about like weeding uh, the garden or working on our publishing, I don't know, we'd rather just sit at our computer and, and do this instead. Uh, we have a good sense of humor with each other. And like I already said, we co-lead, which is a key aspect. Um, so we all have our own specializations. Paul is, a, is really good at typesetting. Linnea is a professionally trained copy editor. Um, 
and Margaret and I have metadata and bibliographic searching as our expertise, we've taught each other everything. And I can sit down and do typesetting uh, on par with Paul, honestly, he, he says so. So uh, anyway, so we just sit down and all do a bit of everything. And it's great. So if you're sick of doing something, you can change what you're doing. It's, it's good to be able to mix that up. And as I said, we have really strong group cohesion. We have joy in our work. And it gives us, we have a sense of purpose. We just, we see the met metrics and we're just motivated by seeing how this work uh, is probably transforming practices and, and, the, and scholarship around the world. So we're looking to increase our team of four to five. We're recruiting someone specifically now. Paul and I are on our charm offense, offensive trying to get this person to work with us. And her expertise is teaching. And I think that's something that we lack. Uh, we do some teaching, but she will go out and you know, promote our work in a way that we are maybe able to do. So we're united in our common goal and we're team oriented. And I already said these things. So, um, you know, if you look in the, into the research about group size and what's effective, you'll read in many places in the management literature that smaller groups are, can be more productive, they can be more engaged. Um, there's no hierarchy. I don't have to ask Paul, may I do this or something like that. I just do what needs to be done. We all do. You, you know, you, you can't get lazy. I mean, you could, I suppose, but we don't want to. We want to hang out with each other and get this work done. So that's a benefit. We really know each other very well. We know, know each other personally and professionally, and this works for us. Um, I, I discovered this recently. There's a concept called micro-solidarity that kind of explains some of what I'm talking about here. Uh, Richard Bartlett is an independent researcher talking about this kind of dynamic. Paul and I were a partnership, and now we've turned into a crew. Um, and our con congregation is, is the people in this room and beyond, okay? So we're doing good works together. Um, there was a question this morning from you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yes, about costs and things like that. So I do have a little bit that I'm gonna talk about here. But what does this cost? It's our salaries and overhead, uh, you know, benefits, our equipment and our platform and preservation. This is the extent of our costs. Basically salaries is the main cost. Our platform is very inexpensive and um, the person who spoke last, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, was talking about the benefits, or I mean the, the triangle, you know, cost, effort, and, and the, other, um, the other thing. Anyway, so cost is important to us. It's very low, and we can't customize it. That's what it was, control. So we don't have as much control that we have a really good relationship with our vendor, and I'll talk about them briefly later, uh, so that we can customize it through them. We, oh, so, but we don't do it ourselves. And preservation like uh, locks or something, portico is what we have used. So skills, I'll just quickly go through skills. These are the skills that you need, the skill sets. People and technical skills are the real ones that, that make what we do uh, work well. The administrative and library skills uh, are kind of subordinate. They're important but not critically, they're not like front and center. Uh, among people skills we have these different relationships that we create with the authors, with the readers, with the vendors, and internally within the library. Uh, so I'll go quickly through these. Now, in terms of author relations, to me, this is the most central important aspect. These people create our content. Um, and how we do it, because we have a small staff, we don't have the opportunity to do it systematically. We have a new dean, and she's asking us to think about doing it systematically, meaning everyone in a department will get coverage or a new person comes on and we're sure to include that person. We don't have the staff to do it systematically. So how we do it is I go out and I just meet everybody I can and I ask them, is your stuff in the repository? And when they say it isn't, we get it on. We just put it on. And depending on how large their corpus is, uh, that will determine how we go about it. If they have 350 articles and it goes over 35 years, we say we'll go back to the year 2010 to start or something like that. If someone has a smaller corpus, we get everything online. So anyway, we have our workflows. I'll talk just a little bit about them. Um, so we have a huge network after all this time. I think we have 60% coverage in our large university just doing it this way. 
we get to know these people. We care about them. They become our friends sometimes. Uh, they guide our direction. I think this is really important. They tell us what they want, and we accommodate. We work with them in a co-production sense. We don't impose our values on them it's too much. We, tell, we ask them what they want, and we try to accommodate them. Uh, in terms of readers, we feel like they benefit. W when we take care of the author, the reader incidentally gets cared for. So we do focus less on the reader uh, directly. But Ranganathan comes in here as well, where uh, every reader has his or her book. We like to think that our small publishing venture is very diverse in what we're offering. And um, there will be sort of something for everyone there. Every book had, has its reader. Even the most obscure things that we put in our repository end up getting downloads. It's really uh, amazing to see what people are interested in and save the time of the reader. We try to maximize the download speed and that kind of thing when we uh, upload things. Readers help us discover problems. This is hugely important. They co-produce with us in that way. And I won't give you an example just in the interest of time, but uh, you can take my word for that. So people skills, vendor relations. This is very important. Paul was telling me that this is sort of overlooked uh, in what we do. And with our platform provider, we need to, uh, you know, we need to work with them. They can't read our mind. They need to hear from us. We need to be very direct with them about what we expect, and we expect them to accommodate us. So we work with a proprietary platform, and we have wonderful relationship with them. Um, and then internal relations, I'm really going to gloss over this. At the very least, your top leadership has, has to be on your side, at least to start. But your biggest fans might not be on the inside. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about what we do, friction, and, and internal relations can be quite challenging, we find. But it's all um, part of it, and it, it's unique to every situation. So technical skills, second most important or equally important with people skills, I should say. So in technical, we acquire content, we edit it, we publish it, and then we have our library-related skills. People skills come into play with all of this. Uh, within reason, I promote my services everywhere. I go to parties. I'm, you know, meeting my kids' parents. If they're a part of the university, I'm, I'm always talking about what we do. And that we've really gotten wonderful projects doing this. Um, and I have my collection development policy in mind when I'm doing this. Because sometimes people will say, oh, I have this memoir, or I, I wrote a cookbook. You know, and that's not what we do. So I tell them what we do, and we go from there. So uh, for editing, proper copy editing is a professional level skill. Now, Linnea has taught me a lot of what she knows, but there's no way I will ever be up to her level with copy editing. It's, it's, um, it's a professional level skill. It's very important in original publishing to have proper copy editing. Before she came on board in 2014, you'll see evidence of the fact that we did not have proper copy editing. Uh, we did our best, but it's really great if you can get a copy editor on board. Copy editing doesn't have to, though, be any certain thing. Uh, we like to promote what we call glo global English. So we don't standardize the English all the time. We have a lot of Global South uh, authors, and we honor their way of expressing themselves. Um, at, as a baseline, serviceable copy editing and proofreading are a must in everything you do. I mean, you have to do some, even if you can't do it to the level that Linnea does. Um, so for technical skills publishing, we decide what size of the item it'll be, you know, how many centimeters and that kind of thing. The overall production values, the typesetting, the graphics layout, cover art and design, um, and the scanning. And, and then we think about all these other ancillary things that are also critically important, copyright licensing, branding, and DOIs and that kind of thing. So administrative skills are co-leading um, uh, the way we do it there. And then we do create some policy, but we keep this to a minimum. I'll show you a screenshot of how little we have, really. Uh, we do have metrics. We do pro, uh, evaluate our program every year. These are requirements. We, we do them, and we think they're valuable, but we put kind of as little time into them as we can get away with, frankly, um, so that we can, can keep working. 
Um, environmental scanning is very important. You know, see what is happening out in the university. We plan on that basis. Our uh, environmental scanning and planning are very fleet. So we're quick to change what we are going to be focusing on depending on what's happening out in the community. Communicating is very important. We meet occasionally, we liaise with people, but again, we kind of minimize all of that. Um, and then platform and technology management is another thing, of course, that we have to do. All of this, you'll see, I'll show you, I won't talk about the percent of, percentage of effort here. So the last Ranganathan here uh, for library skills. The library is a growing organism. We feel that we very much contribute to this. Um, so what do we do as librarians? Bibliographic searching, interlibrary loan, metadata creation, evaluation, and so on, all of these things. Um, we do a lot of copyright consultation, and that's one of our favorite things. So quickly, workflows. Um, we just have this way of doing it. Give us your CV and we do everything else. We do mediated deposit. We don't expect anybody to upload things. We do all of it. And this is to prevent problems because when others upload their own work, they upload cop, uh, illegal copies or they don't credit their, their co-authors and various other problems. It's just quicker for us to do it and we enjoy it. Um, so we, here's just a quick thing about our document specifications. We have all kinds of different variations, but this is the general thing that we uh, will follow. Um, so this is what I was trying to get at. Really, we try to focus on production above all. All that stuff about typesetting, copy editing, acquisition, that's our production. Uh, well, I guess editing is in there too. So now with Linnea, we do quite a bit more of editing. That might even be up to 15%. This, this might be a little bit different. I did this a couple of years ago. Access and metadata kind of minimize that aspect of things. Um, administration, as I just said, we really try to keep it to a minimum. That 2% is a, a goal of ours because we think it's what we need to do. It's not, you know, we're not shirking our responsibility. We think that doing more wouldn't really give us much more of a benefit. So platform, quickly we use uh, BPress Digital Commons. This is a proprietary platform um, and it's worked very well for us. We were one of its first adopters. They have really nice backend uh, functioning that works well for us and our uh, users. So I just said some of the things is very economical. They have excellent search engine optimization. Our uh, results get up there with Wikipedia often. And they have a tech startup ethos. We really appreciate the, that about them, even after Elsevier purchased them. So just quickly, this is some uh, selected metrics because of the audience here. I th uh, Paul selected these particularly. So just in the last year, we've had about 11,000 downloads from Norway which is about you know, 0.002 per capita, which is on par with other non-English speaking country, countries. And you can see the UK and English speaking country, it's about double per capita the number of downloads per year there. And then I have, I'm gonna just go through these. You can see them online. Oh, and I see I have to fix that formatting there. But I did pull them out for Sweden and, and Norway and others. So what material types do we have? And I'm running long, so I'll try to speed through this. We have uh, originally published journals. This is the cover of one exa example, Sequential Art and Art Narrative and Education. Um, and these, this is the list of titles that we have that are originally published with us. So we co-produce for this. We don't do everything. We partner with scholars to publish these journals. We do provide some editorial support. We do the typesetting and graphics layout, but the scholars outside the library acquire the content. They're the editors, they're the peer review administrators. And like you were saying um, earlier from the Netherlands, um, we let them choose how they do it. Uh, peer review is one thing they can choose how they wish to do that. Journal editors have control over the rights regime. They can have the authors retain copyright or it can be CC zero. It can be anything they want it to be. None of our journals is monetized or firewalled. Thank you. Five minutes. So this was the other thing I wanted to get to about money. How much does this cost? We find that we can publish our journals and books for between six and eight dollars per page. Dollars and euros are about equivalent, okay? Um, for PLOS One, it's about $100 per OA page if you pay the APC. 
So it's an order of magnitude different what we can do. Now, we're limited in the number of things we can do. So ours might be a lot cheaper, but we can't offer to do as many as they do. PNAS, uh, that's Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, is more expensive, and Elsevier-Wiley is, is quite a bit more yet again. So this is, you know, one thing that we think we can offer that makes us, you know, why would you go with us? We can do it very cost effectively. So just breaking it down, $100,000 or approximately the same number of euros, can, uh, we can do almost, you know, over 1,000 original uh, library published articles for this. It's like um, 1,040. And then you can only get up to 100 uh, articles with this. And that's at the lower end of the APCs. At the higher end, you're only going to get in the 20s, 25 or so. So we're uh, an order of magnitude less expensive. So just quickly, some of our, uh, some things about OERs, and we could call also these things FOLO, which is free online learning objects. This is distinguished from OER, which is necessarily Creative Commons open. Uh, free online learning objects are free to access, not necessarily available for reuse. So this is what Paul came up with for a definition. They're pedagogical ma materials on connected lessons and so on, just a variety of things. It's a larger, looser category. And these get downloaded tremendously. I mean, there's a met metric I didn't add, but um, they get downloaded about five times more frequently than other types of materials in our repository. So here are some examples of FOLOs or uh, OERs we have in our repository. The physics book has been downloaded 200,000 times. And then our books. Um, so it's scholarly content. And the thing I wanted to emphasize here is that we have a commitment to bibliodiversity, global authorship, global readership. We don't just focus on our local uh, readership. And we do context-dependent editorial uh, edit editing because the, we let the project dictate our editorial approach. We have a very streamlined production. Paul and I have lots of conversations about what from uh, commercial publishing he's, we're able to cut out, marketing and uh, graphics in a certain way and all these other things. We have a pluralist approach to property rights. So this is just for your uh, enjoyment later. What do we mean by scholarly? Uh, I'm going to wrap up here. Bibliodiversity is really what I wanted to emphasize here. We feel it promotes freedom of speech. It promotes cultural and intellectual diversity. And I already said it, it allows for these non-standard editing and formatting decisions. Um, it's motivated by an alliance between the author and the reader and us, um, as opposed to us telling them what to do. And this term was first used in Chile in the 1990s. So just in terms of workflows, we have style guides. Uh, for each project, we change it. It's so you're not going to see a Zio Books publishing house style. It's not like that. Um, so you'll see some variation in production value because of that. We know what our bottom line is, and we stick to that, and we go up from there. So these things are essential. I'm just going to really uh, skip through here. And then other things are not essential. Managing authors is not essential. That's something that Paul was really happy to let go from commercial publishing. Um, and I guess that's it. So this is just what our, this is our, our policies. We have four. Okay, it's very minimal. And you're welcome to look at these. Um, and this is just an, uh, a screenshot from one of those um, policies. So we partner with scholars, and they do all of this, and we do our in-house stuff. And we use lulu.com for our hard copies, print-on-demand, at cost. We make no money on this. We don't want to. That would be a, uh, a nightmare for paperwork. So I already talked about this, and I think that's about it. Just these are the takeaways. We do not want to emulate university presses. We do not want to emulate commercial publishers. We want to take advantage of our small press publishing technologies and connectivity. We want to make it our own, and we want everyone to make it their own. 
The goals are to give scholars a voice. We want high quality scholarly content uh, available to readers. We, we have gotten some friction and push pushback from the community and internally in our library about our approach, but we're persevering. Um, we don't have to be everything to every person and neither does anybody in this room. Collectively, we bring this enterprise to scale. Um, our audience is global, not just local, but you're one of the only per people who can bring local content to the world, so we do keep that in mind as well. So these are some metrics, and I'll just skip through. These are some book covers, and I'm going to end with this. So that's all I have. Thank you for letting me go on. Suan, it's actually wonderful to get an insight into the entire team behind um, that wonderful body of work. Thank you for your talk. Um, next, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Katarzyna Weinpern of Lubin University of Technology in Poland, whose talk will explore the experience of the LUT publishing house with particular reference to open access. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh it's, it's not... <laughs> it's quite difficult. Okay. Thank you for your help. Um, uh, um, my name is Vanper Katarzyna and I work in publishing house on the cen uh, and in Center of Scientific and Technical Information in Lublin University of Technology. Uh, I would like to tell you something <laughs> about open access uh, on our university and uh, about the whole pu publishing process. Um, hitting for the open science, so it will be a short uh, story of experience of... Could you maybe demonstrate? words about Poland and uh, Lublin. Uh, it's the largest uh, city on the east side of Poland. It's uh, um, on 170 kilometers on southeast of Warsaw, Warsaw, uh, capital of uh, Lublin, uh, of Poland. And here you can see the photos from the city. Mm. Uh, Lublin is the academic city. Uh, we have five public universities. Uh, Marie Curie Skłodowska University, Catholic University, uh, Medical University, uh, Life Science University also, and the technology. So mm. we have also five private, so it's the big academic city. Mm. Lublin University of Technology uh, was established in 54, uh, 1954 as an uh, evening high school, technical high school, and uh, after that became a high engineering school and in 77 uh, became a university. Mm. That's why the buildings are in different uh, technical style. Uh, all um, these buildings are gathered on campus and you can see uh, photos from the libraries um, in these buildings. We've got five faculties. Uh, here are listed four of them, uh, civil engineering and architectural faculty, mechanical engineering, environmental engineering, management faculty, and fundamentals of technology. We've got also uh, engineering, um, faculty of engineering and computer science, electrical engineering. Uh, this is our home page. As you can see, there is a, there, it is a center of scientific and technical information. There is bibliometric analysis, library in the middle, and publishing house. Uh, library was uh, the superior unit, um, and uh, last year uh, became uh, a part of Center of Scientific and Technical Information. Um, uh, and here we can see that um, we are all librarians and we are working together. Uh, I work as a librarian, as an editor also mm, in publishing house. Mm, here's a little bit of uh, our story. Uh, we publish in open access since 2008. Uh, in 2000, 
2008, uh, it was a year when a digital library was established. And um, with the rector's announcement, uh, we started to work in a publishing and digital library center. Uh, we have a publishing board and the first doctoral thesis dissertations were published in our digital library on open access, um, in open access uh, in 2011. Um, uh, it, last year was very uh, important for us. Uh, we returned to the name uh, Lublin Publishing, uh, Lublin University of Technology Publishing House, and we started to from, to create our uh, journals platform based on OJS. Mm, here you can see covers of our dissertations. Uh, they are available uh, on uh, in our digital library. Mm. <coughs> Uh, we have also uh, our homepage. Uh, it's in Polish right now, but we are in the middle of changes, so uh, I think it will be uh, also in English. We have uh, here um, most important thing: the pub publishing policy, uh, guide for authors, and um, information about uh, books in print, and the link to uh, OJS um, also. Uh, this is our publishing model. Um, we do um, mm, um, we uh, published our uh, monographs, textbooks, and proceedings materials uh, always after the review process. Uh, then we do layout and typographical correction on PDFs, and uh, we decided it it will be uh, easier and um, the cost will. Uh, be lower um, and after the typographical collection we put the PDF one of our colleagues makes description of the book and puts it in the digital library uh, and the same description of the book goes to the um, national universal central catalog like uh, what uh, like it's, it's called NUCAT and it's uh, um, Global, it's a word cut, so they uh, they take description also from from our uh, national um, and we call it um, publication dualism. We, the the printed version of the book is the same that we put in the digital library. Um, here are our covers. Uh, our monographs are uh, have the, the same layout, mm. unified. Uh, as you can see, uh, yellow uh, and blue. Mm, proceedings materials yellow and green and books uh, that depends on on uh, of the faculty mm, uh, because the needs of our uh, academics were growing we decided to publish also special editions uh, other monographs uh, uh, books uh, about the region about history of techniques and uh, others. Uh, here you can see the difference in covers of our textbooks um, and monographs. Um, we have books in English, mostly in Polish of course, but also in English, in Russian and in Ukrainian. Um, and uh, uh, we want to um, um, be open not only and, and um, we, we know that needs of our academics are growing, but also of our students. So we, th we are thinking also about uh, this group of, um, of uh, person, of, of, of students. And here you can see there is an um, example of uh, a textbooks. Um, it's a brochure, uh, um, brochure book. Uh, it fits to a prone pocket if they go to lab activities. Uh, they they have a um, book in this, this, this format. Uh, and uh, the cost of this book is uh, about one euro, so they don't have to go to the, um, they don't have to go to the copy point to do a uh, copy or to um, take the, um, PDF from digital library they can buy and it, it's a cheap version. So uh, here we, uh, I've got a slide uh, with our digital library. We've got 10 collections. You can see there's, there is a collection with textbooks, with scientific publications, standard, 
uh, standards, uh, PhD thesis, uh, all of our books and textbooks are uh, in open access on license CC by SA. Um, also, dissertations are available for public, and um, this is the example of the book. Uh, we may download the content or we may read it online. Uh, it's a um, monograph. Um, here are a slide with the vi visits in digital library. We can see it's growing. Um, it's uh, very popular. Uh, last year, we implement, we've implemented a, a platform um, based on OJS. We have uh, six journals. We are publisher or co-publisher. Co mm, nowadays, we will have mo three more. Uh, they are also on uh, in open access on the CC uh, BY license. You can see the logo and um, logo of open access and the li logo of license. And here is an example of uh, the one of uh, our our journals and article. Uh, I know that you know very well the uh, the platform. Mm. And um, this is our team. Uh, we are also in four, like um, in Nebraska. Uh, we uh, do other things, not only uh, we take part in promotional activities uh, on our university, we take part in open day and in fair jobs. Uh, we promote our books. Uh, and we do also some workshop for students and for academics. Mm. Here is a photo from the last uh, Lublin Science Festival. You can see our books. And we do also um, some uh, mm, stamps, occasional stamps, uh, commemorative stamps uh, for, uh, for our university. It's uh, other our activity <laughs> in, in publishing house. Um, that would be all. Thank you very much. Uh, Um, thank you, Katazina. Uh, another wonderful example of uh, library publishing and how it can contribute to um, open access publishing generally and really interesting to find out about the promotional activities as well. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Marcus Stumpf of Vienna University Library, who will speak on the Vienna University Press and its publications. Thank you, Marcus. Okay. Is it working? Yeah, fine. Um, well, my name is Markus Stumpf. I'm librarian, historian, and provenance researcher at the University of Vienna. And also, that's the reason why I'm here. I'm a co-editor of a book series at the Vienna University Press. So um, I have to make it clear first that I'm not speaking for the Vienna University Press. I'm more speaking in the role of a librarian and an editor uh, in this, uh, um, um, in, at the Vienna University Press. Um, after a general introduction uh, into Vienna, into the University of Vienna, I, would, uh, I will focus on Vienna University Press, its mode of operation, and its publication program. Afterwards, we will take a look at selected figures and download figures. And for this, I have to say I'm very grateful to Mr. Ketch from Vienna University Press, because normally you don't see uh, these figures. Um, when Duke Rudolf IV founded the University of Vienna in 1365, he also established a university library. So the Vienna University Library is the oldest university library in the German-speaking world. Today, the University of Vienna is very big, with almost 100,000 members. That includes more than 90,000 students and more than 9,000 staff members. The figures shown here are for 2017 and give an indication of the library's performance as well. Uh, in Austria, we are the largest library even larger as the National Library, and we have 
uh, well, also the largest electronic uh, media collection of all Austrian uh, libraries. And in the early 2000s, uh, university publishing and library publishing became a topic at rectorates level, <laughs> but starting with monographs. And so in this course, in 2007, um, Vienna University Press was founded as an imprint and in cooperation with the University of Vienna and Vandenheck and Ruprecht. It is a renowned humanities publisher in Göttingen, Germany. The Vienna University steers uh, the publishing program through a scientific advisory board and agrees uh, uh, up in the publisher's range of services. Um, Vienna University pub, uh, uh, Library wants to publish qualified research works, um, edited collection on spe specific topics and monographs, research reports, habilitations, and so on. One part of the scientific advisory board is the head of the library, of the Vienna University Library and Archive Service. Doing so is fitting uh, to its other activities in this field, like uh, running an open access office, running the repository, doing research data for the university, giving the DOAs, ORCID IDs, ETSs, running the open journal system, doing the bibliometric services and all the things. So uh, this fits quite into the uh, whole range what the university library is doing. Um, well, Vienna University Press currently is publishing 20 book series. So that's what I'm talking about, about the book series, as well as a number of books of monographs that are not part of the series. And to some extent, Vienna University Press uh, is, open, well, is published open access. All volumes at, of Vienna University Press are peer reviewed. The scientific advisory board decides about the book series. If they are accepted, then the editors of this book series doing, uh, are doing the um, review process as however they decide at which faculty and at which is, uh, seems appropriate to their standards. So, um, Every three years, um, the scientific advisory board uh, also reviews the book series. Um, and also important, I think, um, external scientists can, be, can become also editors of a book series. So uh, if the book series is also clearly linked to the university. Uh, I think this is a wise and promising uh, decision compared with other university presses because it incorporates other uh, scientists. Monographs that are not part of a book series of Vienna University Press will be reviewed with external reviewers and the scientific advisory board. Printed books, so all published books are in print and parallel as an e-book and presented in the web shop of Vandenberg and Ruprecht. Uh, and also the articles, chapters of a book will be published in the e-library uh, of the publishing uh, company. Um, well, and if you want to have your book open access, that's the, that's, uh, there are just two book series where it's clearly said that the books have to be open access. In all other cases, uh, the Authors uh, decide by themselves if, if they choose uh, open access or if they want to uh, go along with a traditional way of, of publishing. To talk about, about the costs, it's about open access with Fantnag and Rupert. So we talk, if we uh, have a book with about 300 pages, it would cost about 5,000 euro to uh, uh, put it on open access. 
this is a lot of money, but there are some some funding programs at the university, so you can apply at directorate or even at the uh, you know uni university library services uh, to get co-funding. Okay, all these books uh, get DOEs and all things for if you're open access. You are in your open or the directory of open access books, uh, and so on. Um, and each book can be, after 18 months, become open access. Yeah, that's very important, and this was, I think, a good uh, decision. Um, and therefore, um, it they can be, and that's the. Let's say um, the problem also because if the authors agree to it, and so we could give them open access, but we have to handle with the authors uh, that they uh, allow this. And believe me, if they have decided to not uh, put it open access, it's a hard work uh, to talk to them uh, that they allow it afterwards. So these are the book series titles. And you see uh, this 20 journal, uh, there are 20 book series and just one journal. Uh, four titles are from uh, history, three titles from theology. You see this all this uh, humanities range uh, here. And I have to say, of course, the University of Vienna has a lot of more other programs, so this is just a small. Uh, portion of, of, of what we are publishing. And um, just two uh, series are clearly open access. Uh, that's the Gunnar Hearing Lectures of Byzantine Studies and uh, the um, uh, co from me, uh, co uh, the co edited uh, Library in Context, Bibliothek in Context book series. So, if you look at the selected sale figures in print in the last two years, you see, well, it's not very much. So, of course, we have the tradition of traditional books, but, well, nobody is really <laughs> impressed, <laughs> I would say, by these figures. Yeah. But still, it's interesting if you look here, uh, open access, and I I'm looking here, um, well, the most, the, uh, the second uh, title from, uh, from above, Treuhändische Übernahme und Verwahrung, that's a book about provenance research, uh, um, Fidicure, uh Holdings in Trust, so nobody's interested in this title normally, yeah, but still, if you put it open access, uh, it was bought 31 times in print copy. So I'm, I'm really uh, interested. Uh, I found this very interesting. <laughs> so, and then Fandneck and Ruprecht has his web shop. And you see, open this six books, open access, download um, uh, figures in two years. What you don't know about is that there was a major problem at the web shop. Yeah. They bought another uh, public uh, companies and they merged them together. So they didn't, they didn't work at all. So we have this um, not very impressive uh, um, figures here. Um, but if you look at the e-library, where you have not uh, where you picture down the content of one article, you get a little bit a better uh, impression. So our best selling ticket article is always the yoga. So you know Vienna is very important and very famous for this yoga. And even so, I have to say this, you have a yoga group at the library, yeah. He's meeting twice, we are meeting twice a week, a, a week doing this. Uh, and it's supported from the, from the director. So it's very nice. Um, and I, I really think that the most downloads from this title are from this group. So, but 
we are doing um, other things also. And for my title, like here where I coded it, the Treuhändische Übernahme and Verwahrung, I think it's interesting that it comes to a figure where I can live with it. 1,000 times, 1,100 times, downloads for a really uh, not in, for the public, not interesting title. That's fine. I can really live with this. Yeah, that's OK. And it's open access, so it doesn't say where in other repositories or whatever, uh, wherever uh, it was downloaded. Well, I'm coming to an end. So I think um, for, the, for my um, <laughs> co-edited books as library and context, these figures are very imp important. Uh, this has also to do with a special situation of library and information science in Austria. Uh, since there is not a single professorship at the university in this field of, f field of science, uh, it is even more complex to get any funding uh, for it because we are normally just seen uh, as admi admi administrative stuff. And that's a role I don't think that's quite fitting. Yeah, it's okay. It's part of it, but we are doing other things as well. Uh, and so, um, and also, I'm doing and running this uh, book series because I'm deeply convinced that libraries have to go in this field. And if I know, if I want to know what my scientists are doing, I have to come to become myself a scientist as well. Otherwise, I would never will understand what my what the other historians at my faculty uh, what their needs are. So I'm really uh, very grateful also to the Vienna University the Library that I that I can do this in this in this double role. That's uh, I think that makes gives information and things uh, uh, vice versa uh, to the faculty and back to the to the university. Library. Um, however, another challenge that has to be confronted is that Vienna University Press should be more and more considered as the first choice to publish a book for scientists. But how to get our scientists there? That's a big topic because one of the academic freedoms is to choose where to publish. Yeah. So. Um, but we should be more interesting with this product. And I think, uh, therefore, it should be more open. So the Vienna University, there are leagues of historians who are not at the university, who are not working there, but they are still private uh, researchers. They're doing uh, what researchers do, and they're publishing, but they do it not. They, they're, they publish not the books at Vienna University, but they are uh, came and they had the the uh, they they were uh, they came from the Vienna University. So why not uh, considering them as a as a very important field? And um, yeah, furthermore, I have to say even. German-speaking countries, we are not that small, like the Danish or so, but <laughs> still, uh, we have to accept that nobody else is understanding German. Yeah, that's So we have to form other ways. We do all the books with abstracting, with keywords in English. Well, I think there should be more shift for internationalization and to doing these things more if appropriate, in English, yeah. And I think that would be good for the aim that we have to uh, maximize dissemination, visibility, and impact of our researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I think two very powerful words there, open and international, and also impact as well. And I think that theme is coming through very strongly today. 
Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Professor Goran Trelijevic of the City Library of Panchero in Serbia. And Goran will be speaking on publishing in the public library sector in Serbia. Thank you, Goran. Thank you. Um, I work in a public library as a library advisor and editor. And I want to say at the very beginning, when we say to public, we think, we think in general to print. There are a lot of web pages, dig, digital collection, and let's see, e-books, but they are more PDF, the final version for printing than the real, real e-books. OK, uh, it's a brief presentation, and I'll uh, say something only about uh, journal, library journal, and about uh, book. Um, it's a it's a very specific journal, the scientific journal on theory and practice of librarianship, specific, but um, because it's the most influenced library journal in Serbia. Um, you can see Kavo. It's some. Um, reading group of state uh, library in St. Petersburg. Uh, everything about the library you can see uh, on this web uh, address. Um, some guidelines and structure and so on. Um, um, to say a few words, uh, there are a long tradition. Uh, for publishing uh, books and journals, uh, library, uh, publishing li uh, uh, journals, uh, uh, journals and books. And uh, in Pantrevo, uh, we see the first publication, 1936. I don't know if it's, it's a lot tradition or not. Uh, and we are a little bit specific. Uh, um, we are spe specialized for uh, this library journal and um, uh, books uh, about uh, uh, librarianship and cultural history. And we really have great, great authorities in this field. I, I don't give names, but uh, believe me. Um, we really published the most. It is a relevant Serbian book in this field. And from the very beginning, from the monastery libraries uh, till the Second World War, uh, too. Uh, but of course, we have different, uh, different uh, books, like this best practice is 22 stories about communication, organization, uh, organization culture and li uh, labor public relations. There are some, some authors from, from this book, uh, uh, our American colleagues, you know some of these names, I, I suppose. Um, and I want to uh, pay attention one, <laughs> one, one book, one study, it's Library for a Time. A contribution to the general history of libraries up to the 60th centuries, and he says, but uh, pro uh, Professor Gordon uh, Simoncic, I leave the book and the journal here, and you can find uh, introduction and uh, abstract on, on, on English at Academia Edu. <coughs> this is the cover, and we really are uh, looking for some co-publishers about uh, this book uh, and I, I have an idea to to make some great uh, project uh, in EFLA and to cover all the world to find the best authors and to do this project generally. Uh, and uh, we are very willing to share our experience, to information and uh, to foster our, our group and uh, coalition. Um, ask me nothing, but <laughs> <laughs> write me on uh, my mail address. I live in this mail address, and we'll, uh, I will uh, try to answer you as soon as possible and to answer any, any of 
your question to um, to 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 give you any, any kind of help and or support. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Goran. Some really interesting titles there that have incredible reach and lovely also your call there for further dialogue and cooperation, which I think SIG will help with today. Um, the last speaker in the case study section is Mikael Burke from Finland, um, who is formerly of Helsinki City Library, who will speak on the public library as publisher. Uh, Michael very kindly also circulated a book on this topic uh, via the Library Publishing Coalition before this talk. Thank you to him for that. So further ado. Do you think that uh, the public library is a publisher? If you think that the public library is a publisher, do you think that it can become, become a better publisher? I discussed these questions with two of my friends, Ralph Amisa, who lives in New York and who is a developer. Um, mentioned here, a uh, developer, a technical guy, and who has actually produced uh, something like a library publishing system, but that was already in the 1990s. And the techniques and uh, um, approaches of developers have changed much since this. Since this. Since then, uh, the other one is Anders Eriksson. Anders, can you stand up? Anders is here. He's a local uh, Norwegian librarian and journalist, and I cooperate with him since many years. This is difficult. Okay. Maybe it will now. Maybe it, it's okay. I don't need that one. Um, library. Uh, Anders uh, runs a blog called The Library Takes Up the Case. And we are supposed to speak about cases here. Um, and I cooperate with him there. That's in Norwegian mainly, sometimes in English also. Maybe it's OK now. <laughs> Darkness. What happened? Thank you very much. Um, I sent this first definition of yes. library publishing um, email list of our, our email list. Um, I think it's too narrow because uh, if, if it holds, then uh, my subject, uh, public library as a publisher, is, uh, it's not included. Because it is defining library publishing as the practice of an academic library providing publishing. And academic publishing, in another Wikipedia definition, is said to be 
Dario. A subfield of publishing. Um, och när vi har startat med metadata så har vi ju definition of publishing och det ska ju i det semester har jobbat väldigt mycket med det är så tekniska ting alltså pröva få ting att bli riktigt och och jobba väldigt nätt och liksom metadata och publishing is the activity of making information literature music software and other content available to the public. Nej, detta här med att for sale or for free. And in my view this is er, eller men nämner det väldigt ofta så har vi kanske inte publishing is really more var slags content making available att det har för slutbrukare eh och där har jag väl i kassa another definition i den powerpoint in the eh och så får vi se hur långt det går honorable how do you say in english encyclopedia britannica which is from 1986 which says that I mean, uh, publishing is a, the activity that involves selection, preparation, and marketing of printed matter. Well, this is quite okay, but it is also too well, narrow, so because, for instance, the e-book to uh, uh, we, we have this came out of the dialogue between Anders and Ralph and me. Okay. Would we not be included in it is also alltså vad är det som föregår vad är det som bör föregå vad är det som sker här eh när robot en um, eh i en sån situation I leave det these many definitions um, for now not to bore you more with them Vi vet uh, ju inte vad de har ment när de skriver kring det där academic libraries de and public libraries är det där kan ju vara lätta public and in a way public libraries that they folk gör då obviously har ett informationsbehov och så går det till ett bibliotek och så går det in i ett sökningssystem however when you look at the function som förhoppningsvis ska vara med och hjälpa och täcka det responsibilities men these two types of libraries jag vet inte någon information det differ quite som radical is on ledningar det att skriva det där in där eh och det vet man ju väldigt själv jag jag vill inte gå in to that either because you as librarians are very familiar with this discussion and these distinctions between different types of libraries. Let's see now if it will be dark again. Let's see now if it will be dark again. Let's see now if it will be dark again. Let's see now if it will be dark again. Let's see now if it will be dark again. His name was George Bowerman. Och så har vi också sett i undersökningen här att att de informationssystemen är väldigt viktiga för de amerikanska libraryerna som lagar med att de har en annan meeting i 1915 på egen hand nu än det vi kanske tänkte på för. Då var ju bibliotekkatalogen. Det var en år när den stora kriget var raging. Och Bowerman frågade. Men då var också bibliotekkatalogen. Should the library aid this movement and similar propaganda? That's what I wanted to ask. And um, uh, I shall not go deeper in what happened with that, but he answered positively that the, the library should make uh, should aid the peace movement and contribute. I think I remember that he said it at the end of the speech, which is reprinted in a. Book with essays ja. on material and library history in the United States. That the library librarians should ja. contribute to creating ja. a positive ja. word spirit, something like that. Ja, jo, Sounds nice. Det er nærliggende å tro, eller nærliggende å tenke det. Uh, og det er jo litt fordi at vi vet hvem Knut Hansen er, så vi har noen ideer om det. No. Uh, og vi som... There is one in between now that is from till kanske 42 romaner och så nå dikt och no. några händelser och något sånt. Maybe you are right. Okay. Det är klart. Det Let's take this. <laughs> okay. Då prövar det där då. Så Ja. Well, this is Så får vi This is the most recent statement from the bulletin of the atomic scientists. The journal which you probably have heard about, they have this doomsday clock and they uh, make a new correction of the clock 
each time they find through their analysis of the situation in the world that the situation is closer or more far from midnight and they have just now um, set the clock closest to midnight that it has ever been, 100 seconds. They think that the situation is the world in the world is that bad. Uh, I showed that because I think um, Bowerman's question needs updating. And I have tried to make a um, for this present situation, suitable question, and that would be, is IFLA capable of supporting the United Nations Treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons? And this is uh, in our dialogue and the e-booklet, uh, it's quite a big part of it is about that um, discussing what this question actually could mean. Um, I must say something about this question and IFLA um, as I can from my point of view. Um, you know, there is ICANN, the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, which won the Nobel Prize um, in 2017. And it has a number of partner organizations and just to motivate why I think IFLA could become a partner of this ICANN, which was the mm, motor behind the United Nations Treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which is supported by 126 states. No, 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 of the, uh, not, not by the nuclear states and their allies, but, but other states. Um, and it's led by a smart uh, person, Beatrice Fien, and you see some faces just here. Well, among the partners, I, I thought I would mention two. One is the WILPF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. It's the oldest women's peace organization. So it's quite logical they would be there. Another, which I think is particularly interesting from the point of view of librarians or the, the institution of the library is Majors for Peace, that is, um, the majors of some 7,000, more than 7,000 cities, big and small, in all over the world, have um, formed a campaign organization for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Already years ago, it's led by the major of Hiroshima. And now, the cities are somewhere in between the states and the civil societies. And I think this goes for the libraries as well. Um, and the libraries have a certain autonomy and the library associations certainly have it. And IFLA is actually de uh, defining itself as a non-governmental independent organization. So I think it could. Already in Dublin in August um, announced that it will now join the 
an international campaign for abolishing nuclear weapons. Um, last year in Dublin, at this midterm meeting, there was a nice example of uh, library publishing uh, Helen Fallon um, presented a book of, with the letters of Nigerian uh, writer and uh, social activist Ken Saroviva. They were his last letters, and they, they has, he sent them to a nun in Ireland called Mari, um, it's uh, difficult for me to remember the name, but I have it here in my notes. But let's, um, let's not go too deep in it anyway. Um, this book was published, uh, incidentally, by university libraries, librarians at the University of Maynard, Minut. Um, and uh, it is called Silence Would Be Treason. Uh, so I don't see why it could not have been also published by public library, public librarians, librarians working in a, pi uh, in a public library. Uh, I asked, can the public library become better as a publisher? A little side jump here is that when I published that uh, definition of library pub publishing, which Wikipedia has to this list, I got an answer in private from an Irishman who asked me if I could give examples of public library publishing in Finland. And indeed, I could give him several examples. Um, for instance, local history, um, also some books Actually, books even where I, I have been involved, which were like published at least in the library world, so to speak. Um, uh, but they, to to sort of make the point clear, uh, one one should say that this book, you can say that it is a good book and it is well edited. I have read, read in it. But the essential goodness of this book is my five minutes left. Do I have five minutes? Great. I thought I, I'm already coming to the end. <laughs> Thank you. The essential goodness of this book is actually political. If it is uh, scholarly, then all the better. It's still better, but, but the essential goodness of this book is political. Um, And so I take another example of a book which is uh, I don't say that it is unscholarly, um, but it is not academic and it is not scientific because it is a book of confessions, confessions of a nuclear war planner. Uh, but, uh, Daniel Ellsberg might not be very well known for people who were not uh, grown up in the 1960s and 70s, but he is a world 
uh, famous author and whistleblower. And some years ago, he published a new whistleblowing He released new um, information, like he once did about the Vietnam War. So this is an example of a book which I have looked how many there are in the libraries in Finland and Sweden. I have not looked in the whole world. There were very few of them. So. Um, I don't know how popular this book is among the public at large. And I, I have, there was some kind of pointing, but I have not used this there. This, uh, <laughs> this uh, um, quotation um, tells it, I will, I will not read it now, because, but the idea is that there are two big crises, the climate crisis and the nuclear threat, and they are deeply intertwined. But only one of them is very much deep, debated in the public. But the nuclear threat is sort of um, put aside, it's forgotten. Ellsberg here, at the end of his book, and in this, this is from an interview with him, actually, he just notes that economically, um, mankind cannot have bought uh, these um, enormous military investments and investments in nuclear weapons and mitigating all the climate crisis. That's economically impossible, but it's, there's so much to say about that, and I will not go deeper into it, but I have concentrated my, um, let's call it opinion, in this uh, thesis, that the library must take the disarmament case to the public, and then this, um, it would be very good if IFLA joined ICANN and so gave a direction to all the library association in the world to take up this case of the nuclear threat. And I have even gone so far that I say that silence would be library treason. And this is perhaps a strange concept, but in this publication we go a little bit deeper in. Because Ralph, for example, he questioned immediately um, this concept, but I have tried to defend it there. I shall not do it now. Instead, I must say that in, I, have, I have focused on this one case in order to make myself clear, but there are, of course, mon many more cases and interesting questions about the public library as a publisher. Now they have gone. Now it's end. But uh, I, just say, I just say that I already had the possibility to mention the other aspect I wanted to take up, and that was exactly the cloud, which was up here in the or noon. Uh, excuse, yes, uh, so I, 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 I say thank you for listening. And this, um, this publication you can find no. at that address, which you see there.
Thank you, Mikhail. Mikhail, you can come back. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Siwan. Thank you. Um, so I wonder if we have any questions from the floor, and if you could very kindly maybe just uh, give us a line about yourself as you as you ask a question. Yes, that gentleman there. Thank you. Was it, were you raising your hand there? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pekka Olspu. I come from the uh, Oulu University Library from Finland. I have uh, uh, just a simple question for um, Markus Stump. Um, what prevents uh, Vienna University Press f uh, from becoming fully open access publisher? Why don't you just publish all the books open access? Because it's it's not a question of money. You just show your your sales figures. It's 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 not a question of that. Great question. Thank you. Well, I I can not speak for the Vienna University Press, but I think it's it's the author's right. It's the decision of the book series. Uh, each one has his own politics. Uh, if they have the track uh, doing it this way or this way, in my book series we decided to do it open access. And uh, well, I think we are not that um, prominent to be a, uh, well, a role model <laughs> for, for other scientists, but it would be nice. Yes, yes, you could be a role model, of course. <laughs> it would be you nice. A really, really big university, you, you, you would really be a good example for everyone. Yeah. Thank you, it's a great question, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Lars? It's uh, in a way more of a comment, but uh, Katarzyna, uh, when you sh showed on your uh, PowerPoint, was library, bibliometrics, and publishing, and the name of the institution was the Center of Scientific and Technical Information. And I was, we have seen that libraries have got new services and often a new name, at least for a period. In this uh, university, we call the library a learning center. Some years ago, now we call it library again. But I like that. Uh, yeah. education and we decided to distinguish the uh, bibliometric analysis to support uh, the evaluation process yeah. it's because of a new uh, uh, as I said uh, th these requirements in a uh, new uh, law on higher education yeah. uh, that's why and um, it's all collected we are still uh, all librarians and uh, we do uh, li uh, li librarians <laughs> so uh, all the all the same job all the time, but uh, we wanted to be um, seen and to, um, to have this possibility to uh, develop yeah. uh, uh, also on another fields of, uh, yeah. of activity and uh, to take part in the evaluation uh, process. And that's why. And we hope that um, we will be yeah. more visible, maybe. Yeah, I think it's a yes. good idea and a, uh, to, to promote the new services in a way with a new name, the traditional library, and then the new services. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I have one more comment, one comment to, to Mikael. Uh, because uh, uh, in the Norwegian, we have a library law in Norway that uh, gives a mission statement to the public libraries that they shall promote debate and democracy through debate. And they do that uh, with, a, uh, with a lot of events. Uh, and of course, if they do events and debates, why shouldn't they also take responsibility for publishing? Because in our university, we started the other way. We started with publishing, and then we say, well, we, we buy books, we lend them out, we publish. Why shouldn't we also have debates and events? And, and it's, and it's, 
I mean, in the United States, 50% of the STEM uh, PhDs are recruited by the nuclear weapon industry. Uh, and 100 American universities cooperate with the nuclear weapon industry. And that will, if the UN uh, uh, treaty on uh, abolition of nuclear weapon becomes one part of the of the uh, of the justice, we are not allowed to cooperate with those hundred universities anymore. So it's a it's a theme we need to discuss. I just uh, tell you that I, I have noted this um, change in the library law in Norway, and I think it's very significant that um, it is in the law that the librarians are taking part in the public debate. But I didn't get your point, really, the, the last point, but I remember that the uh, Norwegian library associations, as far as I know, the only ones in the world made a statement in support of Julian Assange so, some um, seven years ago already. And that's uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Um, there's a question from the lady there, and then I think we'll probably wrap up just in terms of time. I, I have one quick question for. Siwan, as well. Okay, and thank you. Wrap up for the break. Uh, my name is uh, Marte Riste, and I'm uh, working uh, with uh, open access publishing in a professional academic publishing house in Norway, Kaplundam Akademisk. Thank you all for interesting talks. Uh, I had one question for Suan Gardner. Yeah, I, I was wondering when you measure uh, the cost of your uh, publications, uh, what you include? Do you also include? Uh, the costs for staff and offices, etc. Is this, yeah. So, so, ah, sorry, you can answer. Yeah, and, and the other question was, um, what, uh, when it comes to editorial work, do you also work on project ideas, improving text? You said copy editing, but are you also working, you know, editorial work basic with the authors and texts, or are you doing copy editing of the text? Thank you. So I had on one slide what the cost consisted of. And so it's it's one of those slides. It's sta uh, staff and overhead, salaries and overhead, the platform, the equipment, and there was one other item there. So that's what I'm basing it on, what we base it on. That's, yes. And uh, th those are our costs, as simple as that. And then about editing, uh, you're, you're asking me about, like, it's do we do more than just copy editing? Yes. The authors will come in and sit with us, and we talk about their projects. We help them develop their projects. So we acquire the projects, then we develop the projects, then we you know, do the production aspects. Copy editing is a production element that's kind of instrumental. You know, you just do it. You don't need the author there. But then we give the author proofs, and they review the proofs, and we get them back, and then make changes based on that. But beyond that, you're talking about like content editing, and we do some of that. It, like I said, the authors drive the, um, the projects, and if they ask for that, we give it to them. And if they don't ask for that, we don't impose it on them. And just one last question, and then we'll take the break. Um, just you mentioned friction in terms of even amongst the library community in terms of promoting awareness of library <laughs> publishing. Um, we've, we've set up a group in Ireland, a national library publishing group. Helen Fallon, who Mikhail referred to there on, the, um, on one of the publications, sits on that group. How have you overcome that amongst your peers? Yes, this is a lot. This could be long. I won't take a long time. But this is important. We feel that if there's friction, this is good, really, because um, it, it means we're doing something that's changing something. And we don't want bad friction. Okay, when it gets to that point, when it becomes toxic or something, then, you know, we pull back. But sometimes it just opens a dialogue. So what we do is we open dialogue. We talk about it. We listen. What is uh, bothering you about this, and how can we change things? We like to get to a place where it's comfortable for everyone. That's not always possible. It's an ongoing thing. And we, we push things so there is some friction. You know, it's part of what we do. Uh, but um, 
it has to be balanced. Thank you. Well, that's a good note to end on. And thank you to all the speakers and maybe a round of applause. Um, really thought-provoking talks. Thank you all. And I think, will I hand it over to you now? Is it coffee break? Um, there's a coffee break now, but first, I would like to remind all of you who hasn't signed up for the breakout session to do so during the coffee break. Um, it's a focus group with Jessica Kirchner and um, there is um, digital learning materials with Buchskapa or digital production with the media section at Oslomet. During the coffee break, um, and we will meet up again in.
Come on, RV, let's start it. I'll start. I'll start it. Du vil ikke høre på meg, altså. Du vil ikke høre på meg, altså. I think it's a really good sign that, that um, great discussions are kicking off, that we're slow getting started again. Uh, so the next session is about library publishing services. And the first person up is Lars Egeland, our host. And Lars is going to be talking about evaluation of OA journals, um, and that is recommendations for a future role for the library. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> we have had an evaluation of some of our open access journals, but the main thing is the recommendation for the future role for the library. This is the open access uh, uh, journal landscape in Norway. You know, Norway is a, is a long country. If you turn Norway round, you'll uh, get down to the south of Italy. Uh, about 100 journals from Norwegian publishers are registered in the DOIA uh, directory. Approximately, uh, I think that's correct, 26 are published by the Scandinavian University Press, Universitetsforlaget, and 16 are published by other commercial publishers. And the rest are published by Norwegian universities, mainly libraries. I think two or three uh, are published from other parts of the university, and mainly without APCs. The background is, of course, the Open S initiative. And in Norway, the Research Council said that from 2021, there will be no financial support to journals that are not open access or to research projects that doesn't publish open access. 
within the uh, libraries we have uh, uh, consortia who have made contract with Elsevier, Wiley, Taylor and Francis and Springer Nature pointing towards open access. That really means that uh, the libraries pay more than we used to because we also paid for the pub for the AP uh, what used to be the APCs. Um, and then we have some financial support for turning Norwegian journals in humanities and social sciences into open access. Uh, 26, 25 uh, journals get support from the research council or uh, uh, for that. Uh, and they are mainly published by, uh, by the uh, Scandinavian University Press. Uh, somebody asked, why doesn't we reclaim the control over uh, academic uh, publishing? Maybe we don't do that because there is no free lunch. Uh, it costs money to publish, whether uh, with all the business models we can uh, imagine. And I've described some uh, business model, the consortia agreement, as I told you about from Norway, between libraries and publishers, pointing towards uh, open access or at least hybrid publishing. And then commercial open access publishers with APC, like Copper and Dam, who spoke uh, here, and, and the Scandinavian University Press. And then publishing from universities based on APC. I think it's one or two uh, journals in Norway based on APCs. Uh, and uh, commercial open access publishers with funding from foundations or universities. And that's, we have a lot of examples on that too. And the last one is publishing by universities, funded by the universities, societies or foundations. And uh, that's what we are doing, but that isn't free either. So University Press, they uh, have their platform, IDUN, and this is an example, Studia Musicologica Norvegica, which is published by Universitetsforlaget in collaboration with Norwegian Muse Musicological Society and with support from the National Consortium for Humanities and Social Sciences. So they went to the university uh, press and said, could you publish this for us? And they will have to pay money to the, uh, to the Scandinavian University Press for that. And, yeah. and then we have uh, Oslo Met's open access journals, started in 2011, and we have today 15 journals. And I say we have, we run 15 journals now. Some of the journals run by Universitetsforlaget has come to us and said, how uh, much do we have to pay to you uh, uh, for you to run it? Uh, and uh, we say, well, it's much cheaper. Not that cheap as in Denmark, but it's much cheaper. Uh, but we don't promote many services. So then they have gone to the university press and said, we want all the services, so we'll, we prefer to pay more money to the university uh, press instead. Some of these journals uh, uh, was established journals that was flip, flipped into uh, open uh, access, like Journal for Kindergarten Research, but most of them were established by uh, by uh, uh, engaged researchers. And the initiative for most journals came from researchers, and this is a university for professions, and none of the professions said, if we want to cons constitute an academic field, then we need a journal. And we'll, uh, since that journal uh, doesn't exist, we have to make it. It was very limited uh, economical support. And I think the idea was that the journal should evolve from a strategic uh, project into a normal operating budget in the university. There was no strategic, uh, institutional strategic and strategy behind the establishing. And the idea was that 
they would be self-sufficient from income, from incentives, from publishing, or from APCs. And many of these uh, journals were also established in cooperation with other universities. And I guess some of them had the idea that in the future we would share the costs and then uh, it would run. The platform and the policy, all journals are published with an CC by license. Reading, publishing and submission of articles are free published on an OGS platform. All journals are registered in the directory of open access journals and also registered in the Norwegian list of accepted uh, publication channels. Um, yeah. The role of the library was that we are responsible for the technical platform. We give training to editors and editorial uh, secretaries and we uh, organize annual meetings for the journals to increase cooperation. We help with indexing, and we promote uh, templates for the articles, metadata, and tagging. The service from the library is free, as long as the journal has some connection with Oslo Metropolitan University. And that means that uh, if they haven't had any connection with Oslo Metropolitan University, they, they recruit somebody from the academic staff in Oslo Metropolitan University to, to be a part of the editorial board, and then they get it for free. Um, uh, but we have said that to be relevant, the policy is that every uh, journal should publish at least six articles a year. And uh, that's part of the uh, recognition by the Norwegian uh, research uh, agency that uh, maximum two-thirds of the authors can come from OsloMet. And Faculty of Education and International Studies, they um, decided to have an external evaluation of six of, uh, of their six journals. And there was an evaluation team uh, consisted uh, of people from the Norwegian Institute of Research in Education, University of South East Norway, and the other university in Oslo, the University of Oslo. And the evaluation covers the period between 2014 and 2018, and the evaluation report was published late uh, 2019. The mandate was to go into peer review processes, routines, and quality. The scope of the uh, journal, the need, the niche of the uh, journal, bibliometrics, citations, look at readers and the number of downloads, uh, look into editorial boards, the qualification of editorial boards, the reputation, and who were the authors, research ethics, and quality of routines and processes from submission to publishing. Their report says that uh, they have between 50 and 66 articles every year. Some uh, journals had very few articles, some had more. The proportion of articles from Norwegian institutions was 59%. 21% come from Oslo Met, and uh, some commented that in some of the journals there were, weren't any publications from Oslo Met, but they paid for the publishing. But if you look to... Uh, Oslo Met has 12% of all articles in the disciplines, in the educational uh, disciplines, of the total numbers in the Norwegian Chris systems and 10% of all articles from this university um, are published in these open access journals. So that means it has a significant contribution to the number of publications in the university. Uh, this is perhaps obvious that the benefits of having a portfolio of open access journals is to contribute to open access to research, to 
that it, uh, it's good for the uh, reputation of the university to publish open access uh, journals and also to stimulate researchers at this university to publish. Uh, Greece, <laughs> smiling. <laughs> the recommendation from the evaluation committee was that all journals are able to justify their existence. The quality was okay, but I said there might come initiatives for new journals, uh, and that means that it's needed to have some criteria to avoid, avoid over-establishing. And that means that perhaps some of those journals that we publish should be closed, also to give room for new journals. Editorial operations vary a lot, they said. There is a need for standardization to increase effective resource use in the long run. What are the alternatives to institutional publishing? Of course, the researchers can publish in other journals. They doesn't always exist. Or they have a level uh, where, uh, which will result in that the, the number of articles published by our uh, researchers will decrease. Uh, one of the things the evaluation committee wanted to look into was if it was so that researchers published their first articles in our own journals and then later went to international journals. That didn't. That wasn't uh, the result. They continued to to publish in our journals, uh, and uh, because the journals very often became very uh, central uh, journals in their field. We could buy services from commercial publishers. That is more expensive. We could discuss that because uh, um, some of the business models are that you pay per article from the publisher. And I guess it's not always more expensive to buy uh, services from commercial uh, publishers as couple and dumb. But often it be it will be. And the question is, um, uh, do the commercial publishers have a higher quality than we have in our, our journals? And there is the idea behind the evaluation was that uh, the quality of our own journals were low, but that didn't, uh, uh, they didn't find that. So the conclusion from the evaluation uh, committee was that maintaining the portfolio will demand a more systematic economical and editorial uh, support from the institution. And then everyone, uh, this is wonderful to hear, Everyone is sit satisfied with the service from the library. But the library can offer more and wider support. The library does not have the experience, the competence, or the support as a professional publisher today, but the library employs more and more people with PhD and international experience from publishing. Therefore, it is an option that the library develop more as a publishing house with editorial competence, offer courses, and build editorial competence, uh, ac uh, access the journals, and uh, maybe also initiative na national networks. So, yeah. So this is what we are uh, discussing in our university now, uh, the role of the uh, wider role for the library in publishing. And at the same time, there was an initiative from university in, uh, in Tromsø, and the uh, University in Oslo and Oslo Met to, to establish uh, a national group among higher education institutions to study models for business, cooperation between universities, technical demands, and so on for 
uh, for library publishing in Norway or in Scandinavia. And that has been discussed in the in the library committee for uh, the universities where I'm uh, I'm sitting, and we said that oh, this is very interesting. We'll have to discuss it with the committee for research, and there is a committee for publishing. And if they agree, we'll we'll make a project on uh, how could libraries in Norway um, uh, cooperate on uh, publishing. Yeah. That was it. Thank you very much, Lars. I think that, uh, that a process like going through an evaluation like that is of huge benefit, you know, to signpost developments, future developments um, in the university. Um, the next talk that we have is um, by Isa Ekanger and Solve Enoxen. Um, and they're, they're from the University um, Library in Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. And they're going to talk. Are, are you talking on your own? Yeah. yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, so Solve is going to talk about support for good peer review. Thank you. Right, thank you. Now, this is going to not come out of my hair without a fight. Um, <laughs> OK, so together with uh, my colleague Aisa, we put together this uh, presentation about how a library publisher can best help um, journals get a good peer review process. So we work at, uh, or we give technical support in Septentio Academic Publishing, uh, which is a publishing service offered by the U university library for open access journals um, associated with UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. and. Uh, Aside from technical support with the platform and so on, we also offer advice on um, other aspects of the publishing process, uh, including peer review. Yeah. And um, so we have now started to um, look into how to uh, get the review process up to a good level. Oh, that did not work. Oh, there we are. So Satanjo has 10 peer-reviewed journals. Um, it's hosted on the Open Journal Systems platform. And um, we have a wide variety of um, disciplinary, of different dif disciplinary disciplines, sorry. Um, and also some of our journals have guest issues um, that uh, where guest editors do the whole process, including um, the review process, and that adds to the necessity for good support. All right, so for good peer review, there's two main issues. One is ethical standards, and the other is technicalities uh, pertaining to uh, keeping the anonym anonymity during the blind review process uh, of single blind and double blind reviews. So there are things that both authors, reviewers, and editors need to know about. And there are uh, the technical uh, technicalities need to be in place so that they're able, able to comply with these. And they should also be reminded of these um, throughout the process. And when it's when we talk about types of peer review, uh, in September we have most of our journals use the double blind peer review, and only two use single blind. Whereas for the rest of the journal world, um, the, it's the flipped, so it's mostly single blind. And as most of our journals use double blind, uh, that adds to the support need with extra, <coughs> because there's extra work with keeping the anonymity, anonymity of also authors. And perhaps we can use this um, um, this one here, Ooh. yeah, to have our 
uh, journals open up a little bit more in the process, um, have more journals use the single blind review process, perhaps. OK, so when it comes to ethical standards in peer review, there are different um, principles and uh, guidelines and so on by different associations. And the main or the good place to start is the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing put together by the Committee on Publication Ethics, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and the World Association of Medical Editors. And of course, also COPE's ethic ethical guidelines for peer reviewers. Uh, among these standards, um, there are some that are more important for us and for the editors of our journals. Uh, one is um, ensuring against bias and competing interests and accommodating for appropriate feedback. And how editors can handle inappropriate reviews and what or, or how reviewers can notify editors of suspicions of ethics violations. And COLP also says that you should have these standards in your guidelines, and therefore these guidelines must be available somewhere. Okay. So for bias and competing interests, um, of course there should be a competing interest statement in the um, journal's reviewer guidelines, but it should also uh, be visible in the review process. So, uh, and they should also require a competing interest statement from the reviewers and encourage them to also list anything that might be a competing interest. And OJS has this functionality where you can make this a pop-up during the review, the review process. Uh, when it comes to appropriate feedback, uh, we've all heard these stories about people who's gotten these really horrible feedbacks. Maybe some have gotten them themselves. Uh, and of course, the journal again needs to list this in uh, the questions they want answered in the guidelines. But another way to do this is to use the uh, review guide. No, sorry, the <laughs> review forms, where the editorial board has put together a list of questions um, that are detailing what they want answered. And this also makes it possible to compare reviews between different reviewers. So that's an added benefit of using the re review forms. So what do the editor do if there's still an appropriate, in the inappropriate review? Well, in OGS, you have this function to revert the decision of a review, which basically unconsiders the the, the, the review, it's still there in the system, but it's not sent to the author. And uh, But it's, it will be still there for future reference, but it's not considered. And also for future reference, you can rate the reviewer and add a, an editorial note saying why you should not be using this reviewer again. Okay, so what if the reviewer suspects uh, violation of ethics. Of course, you can send an email, but we all know that emails tend to disappear in this black hole that's called the inbox. And also when editors leave, you, you don't have access to that anymore. Um, so most journals have the option of uh, giving um, feedback that is only sent to the editor during the review process. And there's also in OGS at least the um, possibility of adding a discussion that is only between the reviewer and the journal editor. And this is possible to do both before and after the review, the review process. So if you discover something after you sent your review, you can still send this and the editor will be notified. All right, so ensuring the blind review or double blind in the case of most of our journals. So there's different things that everyone needs to be aware of. Uh, usually the platform has, um, 
what's it called? Um, there's func functions that will keep the anonymity, but there's still things that people need to remember. So for authors during the double blind review, they have to check the manuscript and replication data so that they've removed uh, their affiliation name and if they have acknowledged their research uh, lab in their manuscript, they need to remove that. And also if they've used a data repository, they need to let the curators know that these data will be used in the um, in a double blind review process. Um, there's also the issue of file uh, properties uh, and comments. So the system adds last edited by and then your name. And um, you need to know how to remove this. A conflict of interest statement is also one thing. Uh, you should give, or authors should give a general statement saying that there is a conflict of interest or there is not a conflict of interest that is sent to the rev reviewer. And then a longer one detailing uh, the conflict of interest to the editor. And then there's the issue of preprints. So this is something that the journal has to decide upon first. So if, whether they want to allow preprints or not, and if they want to allow preprints, they need to let the author know that we can't ensure that your anonymity is still uh, there if you post it. So that would be up to the author then. All right, reviewers, there's a little bit less that they have to check, but one thing is the re review report, uh, that to not put their names in the report part that goes to the author. That has happened. And also the same with uh, file properties. The editor has to monitor all of this and make sure that everything is, or all identifying information is removed before sending things between author and reviewer. And where to find this information is author guidelines and reviewer guidelines. There's also in OGS a pop-up with how to ensure a blind review um, that is um, mainly pertaining to the uh, file properties and comments. Um, and also the editors need to know about this, of course, and we have put together, or we are putting together this editorial resources where we list all of this. And there's also the training we as support staff give the editors. All right, so to sum up, um, there are ethical standards and technicalities that everyone needs to be aware of and that they need to be able to comply with and should be re reminded of. And we as support staff, or if we as a library publisher uh, help, help facilitate this, it makes the process much better and of a much better quality. And it's also standardized and much easier for everyone involved, hopefully. That's the plan at least. All right. Thank you. And that's Aisa. If I'm, yeah. uh, Thanks so much, Salve. That was a really interesting discussion on uh, the peer review process. Um, and building standards into it. Um, so the next talk that we have is from Talia Anderson. And Talia is from Washington State University. And she's going to be speaking on the important issue of library publishing and accessibility. Is that working okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah, um, so my name is Talia Anderson and I am talking about accessibility and library publishing. And um, I wanted to start with a couple of caveats, one being that um, 
I initially, in thinking about this presentation, uh, was thinking of it as a discussion, and so I, I made the scope a little large. Um, web accessibility, of course, is a pretty large issue. Um, I will also be, because I'm based in the Northwestern United States, that's primarily the context I'll be speaking from uh, in, in some of the things that I'm talking about here. Um, so a bit of context, um, at least in the United States, uh, web accessibility is something uh, that has gained increasing attention in part because of a real rise in the number of lawsuits that have been brought forward uh, against um, organizations uh, that uh, have web pages that aren't really particularly accessible. Um, a lot of these, or these have been on the basis of Section 508 of the um, Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, and they have pointed out that services provided uh, that are supposed to be provided to the general public should be accessible as well. Um, so libraries, by impl largely by implication at this point, have, have been involved then in doing more reviews of accessibility. Um, and of course, in libraries, we have this issue. Um, we have many accessibility issues to still address. Um, there have been studies increasingly looking at more of the kind of staple fare of uh, library publishing, things like open access journals, um, institutional repositories, open educational resources. And these studies have really pointed out that, again, we have many issues with uh, all sorts of things to do with the, the alt tags and the headers, reading order, and all the things that you often talk about it with accessibility. Uh, in, the, in discussions of these issues, then, there have been uh, people pointed out challenges that libraries face, um, that we have potentially limited staffing to look at accessibility. We have sometimes limited access to tools, limited funding, um, and then also often a proliferation of resources that are already, that uh, were not born digital and have accessibility issues as a result or that were created by faculty members or others outside of the libraries and therefore may have these accessibility issues. Um, another challenge that I'll mention is really um, perhaps a tendency to take accessibility and reduce it to a bit of a checklist, um, to think about it in a checklist fashion. So that is to take sort of the, the web content accessibility guidelines and to break it down into a set of things to check off, to say, now this is accessible. It's all been checked off. And a couple of problems with that. Uh, one, I think in the libraries, maybe there's a tendency to kind of shift responsibility over to the systems or technical services area, rather than individuals all kind of taking responsibility for creating accessible content. Um, another issue, I think, is that uh, this tends to lose sight of users that we're actually attempting to reach with these materials um, and can kind of sidestep the issue. Uh, for instance, uh, one critique of the kind of common accessibility um, uh, studies out there have pointed out that often these studies are um, put forward on the basis of using an automated tool. Um, and so they present like a percentage of accessibility. One issue with that being that it can overstate problems that may be relatively minor for somebody actually using that material. And it may understate a problem that only appears once, but is very significant for somebody using um, assistive devices. Um, so in the rest of my presentation, um, kind of an attempt to avoid this checklist mentality, I'm not really going to talk about the common things, again, that are discussed with accessibility, like the alt tags and so on. I actually just want to sort of take a step back and look at accessibility um, from the vantage point of uh, of values, a kind of values-based approach to thinking about um, taking on accessibility issues within libraries and within library publishing. Um, so the values that I am going to speak on the basis of are, I've taken these from uh, a discussion of open pedagogy, actually. Um, and the reason I did this is because I felt like these values already aligned well with values in libraries. Um, also, I think that open pedagogy, because it positions uh, people as both kind of co-creators and learners simultaneously, I think that's a good um, approach for I, many of us, I'll just speak for myself, still kind of learning about accessibility and good practices in this area. So um, the first value then that I wanted to mention is responsibility. 
Um, and when I say responsibility, I'm really thinking about a practice of interrogating the potential gaps between our vision in libraries, which are very idealistic and very much about open knowledge, um, and then potentially the practices that may fall short. Um, and uh, so just an anecdote to go along with that. Um, for me, um, I am a scholarly communication librarian at my institution, which means that I manage an institutional repository. Um, and my institutional repository has a lot of accessibility issues. The documents in it have, have many issues. Um, one of the things that I've begun thinking about is that um, it would be lovely if our repository had a policy actually addressing this and potentially providing contact information and pointing out the sort of division of responsibility between what the library is planning on doing and what we expect people contributing to the rep repository to do. Um, this graphic here, um, so actually, of course, being a librarian, my first step in this process was to go see what other people have already done with policies um, regarding accessibility in IRs. And um, I, so I work at a public land grant institution, um, and I decided to look at other public land grant institution IRs. Um, I ended up looking at about 63, and uh, 25 of them had policies. Uh, which was great, although I will say that um, 18 of them were basically um, stock text from Elsevier uh, for their digital commons platform. So not necessarily from libraries. Uh, one policy I did like came from Cornell. Um, and so they again talked about what the library is planning on doing regarding accessibility with the IR, and then also what they expect researchers to do when they contribute papers. Um, they provided contact information and talked about what they'll be doing in the future. So um, these were all great. My IR, by the way, still sadly doesn't have a policy. We're still discussing um, how that will go in the future here. Um, so the next value I wanted to mention is um, curiosity. And with curiosity, really what I'm thinking about here is um, the desire, the willingness to ask questions about who our users are and to learn more about our users that we're reaching with these publications. Um, so another anecdote, uh, this is something I was thinking about while talking to a colleague who works on publishing open educational resources. Uh, and um, as part of the end process for her of publishing her OER, uh, she takes a press books um, instance and then converts it to a PDF. And one of the things that, that she was noticing, so she works at a STEM-heavy um, institution, so a lot of her texts have uh, a lot of math notation, engineering um, notation, and so on. And uh, she was finding that in transitioning to a PDF um, out of press books, uh, she was losing all of the math ML, the, the really good tags that actually made those equations meaningful for somebody studying engineering or studying math. Um, so for her, uh, you know, she was told by technically that these materials were accessible, but she really had to think about her students and what they actually would need, um, which as a result meant really reinterrogating the entire workflow for publishing these books, thinking about what staff they needed and what they needed to completely change this process to make something um, useful for their students. Um, so another value then, uh, empathy. And uh, by empathy, I, I'm really thinking of something a little beyond curiosity to really um, getting at the experiences of people coming from um, the side of using assistive devices and, and potentially having disabilities. Um, one study that I appreciated that uh, I think connected to this value was by um, another colleague, uh, Michelle Reed, at um, the University of Texas at Arlington. And uh, so uh, Michelle um, partnered actually with students in the disability studies program at her university and used the students to help her do a review of accessibility of the OER that, um, that they published there. And so in her paper, um, this is a quote from the paper, um, she outlined some of the really common accessibility issues that, that we see um, across the board really with OER. Um, but this is a, a paragraph that I especially appreciated because um, in it, the authors kind of take a step back again 
and they talk about, you know, really the perspective that uh, informs the creation of these OER. And they point out here that a lot of these textbooks really are imagined for students who are completely able-bodied. They don't have any kind of disability. They point out that real, the real issue here is not even imagining a student with a disability in the first place. Um, and you know, the difficulty of actually thinking about accessibility when you don't even have that audience in mind. Um, I think, again, this kind of thinking is useful as like a, a way of stepping back and then, and then beginning to conceive of um, accessibility practices. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is participation. And, and here I'm thinking about you know, who is actually creating these resources. Um, how diverse is that group of creators, um, both the librarians and also uh, faculty members and others who are creating these, these materials. Um, I think uh, open pedagogy uh, puts forward uh, a, a great example of a way to increase that diversity. Um, you know, the, so this is um, a screenshot of a, uh, a textbook that's been marked up using hypothesis um, to collect notes from students of, on a text. Um, I have a colleague, this isn't a screenshot from the colleagues project, but a colleague at my university um, is working with students right now with a psychology textbook and asking them um, to help her really think about the diversity of the examples used in the book and of the language as well. Um, and that's one way that she's trying to you know, improve the textbook by ma making it more, um, uh, present better for a more diverse audience. Um, I will say so alongside this kind of uh, strategy, there's also thinking about hiring practices. Um, you know, libraries, of course, are infamously white, infl infamously um, not particularly diverse. And thinking about getting more diversity uh, in terms of ability as well, I think would be really useful for us in, in thinking about our accessibility practices going forward into the future. Um, and uh, yeah, so that is, that is really all I wanted to talk about. Um, I would, of course, welcome hearing about other perspectives and so on. And I think that would come up in the question and answer. So. Thanks so much, Talia. That was fantastic. I think that this is a really fitting um, end session for today, where we've been discussing really, you know, library publishers as guardians of, of quality and standards. And, and, you know, there's no point in just having openness without having accessibility of that openness. Um, can I ask the speakers to come down and um, maybe the audience would like to put some questions to them? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So you have a question. Did, did you, you start oh, it doesn't matter. Um, I think I may have ha have more than one question, but I only ask one this time. And that is, um, I have to make sure I'm asking it. I can't ask it of you, Talia. But I was wondering if accessibility is as big a deal now in uh, Europe and other countries as it is in the US. Um, last, last summer, the Los Angeles public Los Angeles Public Library System, Los Angeles Community College Library System lost a very large lawsuit against the National, <clears throat> excuse me, Institute for the Blind. Uh, and the ruling in effect said, it wasn't just the publishers who are responsible for making their information accessible, but the responsibility lies with the institution and the library. And that is, um, I don't know if that's a big change, but to all of us in the US, it seemed like a huge sea change that suddenly placed 
a level of responsibility on us that we have never had before. So if the publisher doesn't deliver the product we need, it then I think becomes incumbent on us until there's an appeal or the ruling is modified, it becomes incumbent upon us to make that accessibility happen. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what the situation is outside of the US. Does anybody want to talk to that? Say what? Maybe somebody in the audience that can speak for the uh, rest of Europe. I can say something about uh, Norway. We have a law on uh, yeah, uh, law on accessibility, uh, which was really implemented for two or three years ago, and from the uh, from first. Uh, of January 2021, it's going to be implemented for all the universities. And <clears throat> I know the Scandinavian airline system, they got a, had to pay a lot of money because their web page wasn't uh, accessible uh, enough. And we are working rather hard now this year to make sure that all of our services are accessible. That means, for instance, with us, with the film archive, that everything has to be text. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot of, of work to, to be done. And there have been some discussions about databases. But uh, as far as I know, uh, there have only been discussions. I don't think the law will require that we are, respons that we are responsible for, for uh, uh, result from databases. But there have been discussions about library systems. Uh, f for instance, for uh, people with dyslexia, uh, how do you search in library systems? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you know more? Well, I know they're trying to make, uh, like, what's it called? The, um, if you want to be outside, they want to make it more accessible for everyone in Norway as well? Um, well I, I think what I, I met was heading in your database direction, which is that, as I understood the ruling, now, and now Talia may be able to jump in and, and clarify or help, but for instance, if I take a subscription to the Times of London, the newspaper, and if the Times of London has an accessibility statement, but it is lacking in certain elements, I may, as a library in the US, be vulnerable for that. Because it is also my responsibility. So that I think that's how far the ruling last summer went. Now, there is hope that some of that may be modified on appeal next year. Yeah. I. I um... I haven't read super deep into it, so I can't really clarify. But that sounds, I, I definitely feel that I've, I've heard, um, you know, for people who have been hired on to focus on accessibility at libraries, it does seem like they are also focused on looking at, very carefully at, um, you know, databases and subscriptions for vendors as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jesper, did you have a question? Yes. Something, something completely different. <laughs> The evaluation you talked about, is that publicly available? Uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, published, but you can. Uh, it's uh, not closed, so you, uh, I can give it to you. That's no problem. But uh, I don't think we, uh, it has been published uh, on any platform. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can read it, but it's in Norwegian, so... <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for our speakers? I have another one if no one does. Um, and this may be a very European thing that I'm not understanding fully, but I've heard people here say, uh, we will publish X, Y, Z, but if they, the faculty, the scholars want services, they have to go elsewhere. And I don't understand what the continuum is between services and going elsewhere for other services. Isn't it all just kind of one 
long line where maybe you just have an institu institutional repository. And then down here at the end, you've got not just peer review, but you've got your visual abstracts and the whole thing. But it, it felt as though people were speaking about a dividing line after which um, the library would not provide a service. I, I found that confusing. Well, in Norwegian, we have two terms. Utgiver, that's publisher. Forlag, that's also publisher. Uh, or, do you, uh, or perhaps is it more publishing house or, or university press? I think most uh, uh, of the uh, uh, libraries that publish in Norway, they take the role as more of a technical uh, publisher. And the uh, editors are on faculties. And that was the point of the evaluation uh, that I described, that suddenly the faculties discovered how much they paid for the editors working around in the, uh, at the faculties. So it's a discussion, how far should the services be? How far should the libraries go in their services towards uh, on the publishing field? Adam? So, so it's, it's going to be a local choice, right? Yeah. Because QU in Australia was, you know, way out there with their um, video abstracts and all of that. So any library can make a choice to be anywhere along the continuum? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's only a question of resources, I would guess, yeah. And uh, uh, for some of you, uh, during the breakout session tomorrow, uh, the, you can see the, the studios that we have, because we produce the same uh, films. Um, and that's a historical coincidence that uh, part of, uh, of the organization that was uh, given to the library was a media section with 10 people working with uh, producing films. So there's a great opportunity there for your video abstracts as well. Does it? <laughs> so Sue, you have, Sue Ann, you have a question? So Solvig, uh, do you know of any examples of uh, like uh, when a, a reviewer has been complained about and there's been abusive uh, reviewing and what the res how the how it's been resolved, like how that system has been used effectively? Uh, yeah, we had one instance last year when an editor said, "Okay, we've got this really inappropriate review, and how do we deal with it?" And then we used or told them to use this revert decision uh, function. We also had a situation like that, that it was almost um, because of the anonymity that it, there can be a kind of a troll-like behavior. Um, so we just made a note and, and didn't use that reviewer again and passed it on to somebody else. Does anybody else have a question? Okay, well, listen, thank you so much, Lars. That was, that was great, Solve and Talia. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, that is the end of this day. For those who, of you uh, that wants to come for uh, dinner at the restaurant, we'll just uh, walk from outside. It's a hundred meter. For the others, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.